So I'm pretty sure that we were involved in some weird couple's killing spree last night. But me and my boyfriend's family, we're big campers. We try to go as often as possible and try to find different places depending on the weather and the season. We booked a beautiful spot on the lake and had been anticipating this trip for months at this point. Imagine our shock when we got to our site and we discover that the lake has flooded most of the campsite with the exception of ours, one next to it, and then one about 100 feet away. We didn't get to enjoy the lake because, well, there was no beach access and the water was not safe. We shrugged it off though and we set up our campsite as usual. Now, at about 7pm we see a car pull into the campsite right next to ours. No big deal, we just got about our night. I noticed though that they were not in a hurry to set up camp. A middle-aged man and a woman got out of the car. I'm a very observant and paranoid person, so I notice details that most people may not think anything of. In my mind though, these campers arrive really late after check-in and don't unload anything from the car. They didn't talk to each other and they kind of just looked into our sight in passing. Again, no big deal I think, but a bad storm hit us a few hours later and we were literally holding down our tents while the couple next to us just sat in their car, no tent. I still thought that this was odd, but my boyfriend said they probably were car campers and had the back seat set up to sleep in. Okay, makes sense I guess, but still, why come to a tent campground? Anyway, we go to sleep and all is well until I'm awakened by the sound of footprints in our vicinity. We had been drinking, so the fact that this noise woke me up means that it was very close to our tent. I spring up instantly and listen. I heard people walking up to our tent and saw the silhouette of a man through my tent too. In a state of panic, I unzip the tent and look outside. Two people with red headbang flashlights are standing about seven feet from me. I rush myself back into the tent and grab my pepper spray air pistol. During all of this, my boyfriend wakes up asking me why I opened the tent like this, and I explain what I just saw. His reasoning is that it was the neighbors just gathering firewood and I can't shoot them about that. Immediately though, the people walk away and we hear silence once again. I take a moment to think that Maybe I'm being paranoid and am also just a little bit hungover. I try going back to bed but can barely sleep at this point. The next morning though, we wake up and the couple next to us has what looked like a tarp tied from one tree to another. I'm thinking, what the heck is that? I notice that the man has the same khaki long pants he had on the night prior and the woman also wearing the same clothes. This in itself isn't weird while camping but... What was weird is that they were not dressed for camping at all. It's hot and the clothes that they were wearing were not what you would wear in this environment. Long pants, almost like to protect you when going through the woods to hijack another site is what I thought. We go about our day though and I keep noticing that the couple doesn't seem to interact with each other like at all. They don't talk and start a fire in the fire pit for lunch taking it very easy. Me and my boyfriend's family though, we decide that due to the weather in the lake, we would head home early. Well, the couple next to us, who had literally just started a fire, immediately packed up and left just as we started to pack. They left in a hurry too. We eventually finish packing though and we get back to my boyfriend's parents' house and decide to stay for a while there. Well... I told my boyfriend's parents about the whole thing and how often weird it was and what they had to say honestly chilled me to the core. They said that the man upon arrival seemed to be antagonizing the dogs. They have a Rottweiler mix and a pit mix to see how they would react. They weren't sure why he took this stance but after me telling them this we put our stories together. They pointed out that he would stand and stare at the dogs while the woman was acting busy doing absolutely nothing but just sort of moving around. Then they pointed out that the campers sat facing our campsite and not the lake. They also noticed that 
There was minimal interaction between them and just seemed to be staring at us the whole time. They said one of the dogs would growl occasionally throughout the night and they didn't get much rest that night. When I brought up that my boyfriend said that they were probably just getting firewood, they both said, why would they go out of their way to collect firewood that has been heavily rained on? Also, why wait till we go to sleep and then pack up the next day and leave? So, this is what I think. I think these people were locals who knew the condition of the campsite and scoped it out. They noticed that our site was reserved and isolated. No one else was there but us and them and some other campers pretty far apart. I think that they camped out to either rob us or maybe even murder us. But then heard my boyfriend say something about not shooting them, not knowing that it was a pepper spray air gun and they backed off. Then they spent the afternoon observing us until they saw us leaving and they decided to call it off. Because, honestly, none of their behavior makes much sense. So, my question for all of you guys is, am I crazy? My idiot friends and I thought that it'd be fun to convene with the spirits pretty much daily one summer. We'd regularly break out a homemade Ouija board to see how goofy we could get. Because it gets too hot to do anything outside during this time of year, we had to find things to keep our 14 to 15 year old selves entertained in, well, let's call her Jennifer's tiny little house in the 90s. Things went from casual and believable. I'm a teenager who died in a house fire, and I'm an old woman who died of natural causes, stuff like that, to downright disturbing. Like, I've never had a body, but I'm able to experience life down here if you say you accept me. For those, we'd always take our hands off and demand a new spirit. After what was essentially auditioning them, the gang and I managed to settle on a rather gentle entity who went by AJ Duke. AJ said that we could talk to him pretty much whenever we wanted. He was eight years old and didn't want to cross over because he liked watching people go about their lives and he'd been doing this for hundreds of years. Sounded like it was made up, but whatever. It was a Ouija board after all. All of it was kind of made up, right? Well, it was all well and good for about a week or so. He would tell us things about other people in the neighborhood and his usual terrible spelling. And it was always hot tea. We were so polite back and forth with the thank you and you're so adorable, cringe I know, but we'd occasionally bring AJ up in jokes and casual banter when we weren't playing. He was kind of like a fourth wheel for a few days there, but then it got weird. AJ revealed that our playing was attracting bad spirits onto the property. He said that we shouldn't talk as much anymore. But if we asked for him when we started, he would try and take up the space so they couldn't talk to us. We felt very protected by this little dude, corny as it sounds. AJ was always around and game to talk when we sat back down to gab. Soon though, we started noticing the thing getting faster and stronger. Our arms would feel pulled this way and that and go to letters faster and with incredibly skillful precision. Increasingly, we'd end up putting the board away because the vibe started to feel super sour in the room. It's gross to say, but the gentle aspect that we liked about this spirit was replaced with wording that was only better spelled, but sexual and catty in nature. And even though we'd put the thing away once it got all weird, We'd always go right back later into the evening or the next day. It became sort of compulsive in a way. Anyway, one night, Jennifer's older sister stopped by to visit their mum, but decided to hang with us for a while. It was literally the first time she'd ever did this, and it felt really cool to have someone who was pretty popular in high school kick it with us. When she came into Jennifer's room and saw the Ouija board, though, she got instantly peaked. We showed her what we usually got up to and she was skeptical at first. She said, 
I'm going to go into the hall and hold some fingers up. Let's see if the Ouija board can get it. So she does it, and one by one, it kept nailing it. You could see the smirk wipe off her face and go into something akin to fear at this point. Then you could see the fear go into a desperate curiosity. She sat down and played with us, getting some gossip about her parents' divorce that we didn't even think to ask about. It didn't take long for the sexual caddy stuff to get cranked up again. She was looking at us with a face that also felt the air shift. When we did our usual bellyache and hands-off ritual over it though, she protested. She thought this was when it really gets interesting. And what did that thing suggest we do not five minutes after we decided that she might be right? It suggested that we hold a seance. And you can probably guess what gang went along with it because cool big sis got super excited at the idea. So we did. The board told us to get into a circle and to hold some hands, then call for a spirit to appear. Mind you, the Ouija isn't spelling things out as cleanly. It'd be something like circle, C-I-R-C-L, hold hand, invite, and that's the good spelling. Anyway, we do as instructed. Nothing was happening at first, in spite of big sister's insistence that if you're there, show us a sign on repeat. Still, our big round eyes would look around at each other. I'm not sure if we were hoping something would happen or if we were waiting for one another to call it off. Nobody wants to be the ultimate nerd though. And if we played our cards right, we might be able to hang with her crew as they smoked cigarettes between classes and generally looked beautiful and cool. If you're there, do something, she commanded. A newspaper clipping taped to my friend's mirror flickered and we all jumped a bit. But she confirmed that it was the ceiling fan and said that it does that periodically. There's maybe another minute of Big Sister making demands and I was certain someone was going to speak up and break the circle. But then Big Sis dropped, If you're here, I give you permission to show yourself. And not even a moment after she uttered those words did she leap off her feet and scream while pulling her shirt off. Get off me, she was screaming, and Jennifer immediately hopped up and pulled the cord to turn the light back on. Her big sister threw herself back first into the wall as though smashing an invisible something that was on her. I remember a single stream of spit hanging from her mouth as it hung open for a moment. It was just really odd to see such a... A cool person looking decisively, well, not, but I digress. It was absolutely terrifying. She spun around and screamed, what is it, over and over, and just below her bra strap, suddenly three scratches appeared, in some places deep enough to draw a bit of blood. We instinctively huddled around her, cloaking her in a sort of protective shield, but had no clue what to do except to move that huddle downstairs and into the living room where her mother was watching TV. She leapt up and took a look at Big Sis's back as we frantically explained. And what we saw was AJ in a sort of welt and blood form. AJ. After this, her mum made us burn that thing. She kept saying, I told you not to mess with it, I told you. And in rare fashion, Jennifer didn't utter a word of protest at all. She just asked advice on the best way to burn it. A strange bonding experience, standing in the backyard at night and watching her mother, usually quiet, sullen and withdrawn those days, put one arm around Big Sis and use the other to continually douse the doomed board with lighter fluid. In the end, I never did get to stand outside with the cool kids. In fact, if anything, she pretended not to even see us even harder. So full disclosure, I haven't told many this story and, well, after typing it out, it sounds really out there, I realize that. I've had several paranormal encounters over the course of my life, but this one was the first. When I was a kid, I had a friend named Boo. I called him this because you could see through him. 
Boo and I played a lot when I was little, even introduced him to the rest of my family. We pretty much did everything together. He was cool because he changed his shape. He could be little like me or big like my dad. He could walk through walls and flew with wings on his back. A week or two before my fourth birthday, Boo wanted to play in the front yard, which was pretty normal for us. After a while, he said that we had been friends a long time and he wanted me to meet his family. He said that he told his parents and siblings about me and he said everyone was super excited to finally meet me. He told me that they were going to throw me a big party with all the cakes and candies that I could eat. As you could imagine, at this age, I was very excited. So I asked Boo where his family lived. He told me that they lived in the other world, but that it was really easy to get to. I asked how to get there. I was concerned that I couldn't go because, well, I didn't have wings like Boo did. He said that we didn't have to fly to get there, and all I had to do was follow him away from my house. He wanted me to go down the street and into a small grove of trees. I got kind of scared about getting into trouble, and so I told Boo that Mummy and Daddy say that I'm not allowed to leave the yard. He said that they're not with us right now, so they won't know that we even left. Dad was inside watching TV at the time, and I think Mum was at the store. I still wasn't sure, though. He told me, though, that we were best friends and I should trust him. Boo then took me by the arm and started leading me out of the yard. He had opened the gate for me because I didn't know how to. I walked with him to the street corner. I stopped when I was suddenly filled with an overwhelming sense of fear. Boo asked why I stopped. I told him that I was scared because that's the furthest I'd ever been away from the house without mummy and daddy. He said not to worry though, because we're almost there. His grip then tightened around my arm, and he started pulling me hard. I told him that he was hurting me and to stop. Boo then told me, in a very flat voice, to be quiet. He said that if I didn't behave that I wouldn't get my party, and that they would have to throw all the food away. I started to cry at that and asked why he was being so mean to me. Boo said that it didn't matter because we would be in the other world soon anyway. Crying, I told him that I didn't want to go anymore. He responded by saying if I didn't go with him, then he would just leave me there and I would have to find my own way home. I said fine and yanked my arm away from him. He then made his face look really weird, like not human weird. There were shapes that shouldn't be there and parts of it were really sharp. And then all of a sudden, he just disappeared. I did make it back home and sat on the porch and cried. Boo was my best friend at the time. I didn't understand why he was so mean to me. A few minutes later though, my mum returned from the grocery store and asked me what was wrong. I told her everything about mine and Boo's fight. She looked back though and saw the gate was still open and reminded me that I wasn't allowed to go outside without her or my dad. My father also got into trouble for not keeping an eye on me. But that wasn't the last time that I saw Boo. He was never the same after that though. He kept being kind of mean to me. And one day, I told him that we weren't friends anymore, because friends aren't mean to each other. So I told Boo to leave and to never come back. And after that, I never did see him again. Years later, my mom told me how scared she was after I told her about what happened, because she said that that gate was open that day when she got home from the store, and she knew that I was much too little to open it by myself. So, a kind of scary thing just happened to me a couple of hours ago, and... I'm still kind of shaken up by it. A woman was knocking at my door and when I answered, she said that she heard a child screaming and an older male yelling. She told me that it was super loud and she heard an older man saying something along the lines of, people are looking for you now. I live in a duplex with my boyfriend and dog. 
We live on the main floor and we have a neighbor who lives by himself in the upstairs unit. We have absolutely no children. But I also found it odd because moments before this I was in my shared laundry room that you access from the backyard with the back door open. I always do that to let my dog out into the backyard and I can assure you that I heard absolutely nothing. The way that she was talking and the look on her face though seemed really genuine so I was trying to reassure her that we had no children and she probably just heard one of the neighbor's kids or something. We live close to the city in a populated area so there's lots of kids and they scream when they're playing all the time. We just kept going in circles though. I didn't have any children in the home and she most likely had the wrong house. I even offered her to peek over the fence and check the yard if she wished. But otherwise, that was really all I could do. But when I'd say these things, she'd just stare with this accusatory look in silence, then start up again on what she had heard. That's when she began to subtly force herself through the doorway, like a foot or a hand. By this point, our upstairs neighbor and my boyfriend heard what was going on and joined me at the door. She just refused to accept my explanation though, and eventually fully got herself into the doorway. She clearly wasn't going to leave, so that's when I called the police. She stood in that doorway until they arrived. After the cops talked with her and asked us questions, we found out that she admitted to using meth earlier that morning. So they told us that she was just experiencing hallucinations due to coming down from that. But they had to keep telling her that you're free to go now, and she very hesitantly left. She kept turning around and looking at the house, so the cops even hollered out, let's just do a quick check to make her believe they searched the house. And I know that this could have been so much worse and isn't the craziest thing, but still, I'm really nervous that she's going to come back, and I can't stop checking my windows. Plus, someone that high on meth, well, they can't be the safest, right? This took place a few months ago. So, there are these three abandoned houses as well as three barns close to my house and are going to be getting torn down here in the next couple of months. So me and my siblings thought... Why not go and check them out before that happens? I'd already checked them all out with a buddy, but I wanted to do it again, but with my siblings this time, because, I mean, why not? We had only explored one of the houses previously, because there was a small window that we could crawl through into the basement, and another hole through the wall that we crawled through to enter the house, since all the doors were boarded up pretty much. But there are two more houses we haven't explored yet, one being really small and the other being absolutely huge. After some research on the internet though, it made sense as it seemed as if the house was leased to multiple people, mostly around the age of college or to younger families who maybe couldn't afford to rent entire apartments. The time before, when I was with my friend, we brought a screwdriver with all sorts of those attachment things that go on the end so that we could unscrew all the different bolts and then used a hammer for the nails too. When we got there, the board was already torn off luckily, even though it wasn't the week prior when we first tried to go in, when we didn't have the screwdrivers. Also, I'll call this house the Red House since it has red brick. To describe this Red House, it's like you connected two average double story houses together. It is that big and, I mean, we ended up taking an hour to explore it, but that's because we were looking around too. This time when me and my buddy explored it though, it was pretty cool. Not too much graffiti and lots of stuff everywhere on the ground. We found some old cheap purses, Pokemon and baseball cards, a bunch of broken keyboards, books and old school supplies, plus a lot of other completely random things. There was even an old tanning bed that I think we discovered was from the late 80s. There were the occasional drug beetles and pills, usually in corners of old bedrooms or in the bathrooms. And the next time, I just wanted to experience this again with my siblings. This time, it was night when my mother was asleep, so we could actually get away with it. I dropped them off in my car and 
I drove half a mile to a trailhead where I could park my car and it would be hidden. I then rode an electric scooter the half mile to where they were so we could go in. Now, there was this gate that we had to go over since there was barbed wire, and so I folded up the electric scooter and hid it in the tall grass. This road behind the gate, it led to the first house that we had already been in, so we were just trying to go to the big one. From here, you have to walk pretty far through this tall grass to get to the red house. As we approached it, we finally turned our flashlights on and then entered this house. Last time, me and my friend were calling out to make sure nobody was inside, but this time it was night time and I didn't want to risk somebody calling the cops since they heard yelling near the abandoned houses at like 2am. Regardless though, it was a stupid decision. In any case, we made our way in and we looked around. I think it's also important to note here that this isn't the front door, it's actually the back door. One of two back doors, in fact. The house is on a hill, so from the road, it sort of looks like one story, but on the other side, you can see that it's definitely two stories. This back door is in the very corner of the house, so you sort of explore from one end to the other. As we walk through, I could have sworn that I heard some light footsteps. But this is an older house, I looked it up in fact and it was built in 1964, has 7 acres of land and is 3,800 square feet, so pretty big, yeah? But anyway, it didn't sound any different from when me and my friend first explored it, and it was night so quiet sounds were extra loud. As we made it through the other end of the bottom of the house where the staircase was and made our way up, I heard more footsteps. And this time, I told my siblings that we should probably head out. They didn't hear anything, but they were also under the assumption that we were the only ones there, and they weren't being very cautious or aware, I guess you could say. But when you go up the stairs, though, on one side it leads to the garage, which is very small for such a large house, again, probably because it's older, and on the other side you go past a short hallway, and it leads to the kitchen and a family room with a sort of lounge area, I think you would call it. This whole area is super open and it feels like a lot of empty space, but it only covers around half the upstairs. On the other side is a straight hallway with around four bedrooms and a bathroom. And that was when I thought that I saw somebody moving from one bedroom across the hallway to the other, from left to right, but my light didn't go very far since I was using my phone light. I start angrily whispering to my siblings who are already kind of close to the hallway, which leads to where I saw the person, as to not yell but to get attention urgently. They ignore me though, which really ticked me off, and I quickly walk across this open area to try and maybe yank their arm, until this time we all hear something drop. In my opinion, the guy dropped it on purpose to let us know that he was there, but after this next part, really, I'm not completely sure. Immediately, my siblings and I jump. It sounded like a bookshelf was knocked over or something, and since it was really loud and heavy as we could feel the ground vibrate as we were upstairs, it was now confirmed that somebody was definitely there with us. We turned around and started running to the staircase, which is pretty much in a straight line. The bottom floor sort of zigzags around until it leads to a hallway that goes straight to the other side of the house. As we make our way around the zigzag rooms and make our way to the corner with the hallway, we start hearing running upstairs towards that staircase. Obviously, we're already running, so we don't slow down. We turn the final corner and make our way outside where I run in a straight direction and then to the left in an attempt to hide in the tall grass, which also has a direct line to the other side of a huge grass area to where the gate is. I lay down and when my siblings run out behind me, I tell them to get down as well. We were maybe 30 or so feet deep into the grass when I see a dark figure run out of the house a few feet, stop, look around and run into the small house next to this one, which is only like 50 or so feet away. I thought that that house was all boarded up still, but 
It looked like he ran to the side of the house where I guess his entryway was. There was a, a large shed thing in the way so I couldn't see exactly where he went but I knew that there was barbed fence over there so he would have to run behind to where we were to follow us as there is maybe a 20 foot wide gap where there is no barbed fence so I guess that way vehicles could enter. In any case I heard his footsteps running around but I couldn't see where he was. We started to sort of army crawl across the grass but really slowly as to not make much rustling noise. We start crawling faster but then I heard his footsteps stop so either he ran away or was stopped maybe looking at us. I kept crawling on all fours since the grass was now tall enough to still cover me and I was looking behind to see if I could see his outline in the dark which thankfully I couldn't see him. We started to hear a cracking sound though and it sounded like he was cracking the plywood boards but I don't know why he would do that. I don't know what it was to be honest. It then sounded like he was frustrated though as we could hear loud grunts. We just kept crawling though. We were maybe crawling for a good five minutes to get to the other side even if we were far enough for him to not see us. It honestly felt like a lot more and every minute felt like ten. We eventually get to the road though which led to the gate and at this point we stop outside the gate and wait for the few cars to pass before we crawl through. I have my siblings crawl under first and I swear I heard running through the tall grass behind me but as I made it under and through and started running it didn't actually look like he was following us. Maybe he was too far behind for me to see but I'm not sure. Also yes I did get my scooter which my brother had already unfolded and was riding away with me and my sister running behind. We didn't stop until we got to the trailhead off to the side of the main road where we literally threw the scooter into the back, jumped inside, locked the doors and peeled out of there. In the end we drove off peacefully knowing that this person was definitely homeless and could not get into a car to drive off after us. He was also probably not on anything as he was moving too quick which I don't know if it would be better or worse for us if he was and we ended up having to fight back but luckily we didn't have to. In the end we made it home safe and sound and we didn't speak about it at all with our parents. My siblings they kind of laughed about it more after the first week but it still scared me knowing just how serious that was. I don't think they actually realized just how dangerous that whole situation actually was. We survived though and I guess that that's all that really matters. Also definitely I do not plan on ever going back. This happened almost three years ago. During COVID I was sort of lost and extremely bored without human interaction. That was until me and my buddies found mountain biking when our parents allowed us to see each other outside. Living in Washington state there's a lot of woods perfect for mountain biking trails. Us being under the age of 16 at the time we had no license to drive an actual mountain bike parks so instead we built them. Apart from the one trail already near our house with a 30 foot gap jump which was way above our skill level at the time, we wanted to make something new. Basically there is an entrance to this trail near my friend's house and you walk down it a ways until you find the normal trail. To get to our trail you find this one spot on the trail that turns 90 degrees to the left but instead you go to the right of the trail through all this mud, weave between these fallen trees and tree branches. And from there you go right where it sort of curls around until it goes straight again. From there you go straight through this small pathway which is still hidden from all the ferns until you reach this abandoned forest road. Now you follow this forest road down which goes for about 80 yards or so. It's also covered in huge amounts of mud and if you were there you would see all the clumps with our footprints going about 6 or maybe even more inches deep especially in some spots where it's extremely deep. There are more fallen trees on this forest road but 
If you continue to make your way down until it sort of stops, and then go off to the right, and walk around this hidden pathway that weaves and curls all around this huge area of ferns for maybe another 60 or so yards, you finally reach the bottom of the trail that we made. It probably takes about 10 minutes to get there, but around 5 on a good day where it isn't wet, like during the summer. Essentially, you have no reason to be there unless you're either lost, which is almost impossible to do unless you purposely wander off the trail, or are looking for it. And on this particular day, my buddies couldn't go out to help build, so I decided to bring my younger siblings along. The only reason I felt scared going alone was around a week earlier, me and one of my friends thought that we found a cougar den with some scat nearby in a few spots. I also just didn't want to be alone that far out. My sister decided to come with, but my brother, I guess, had a friend who he was going to hang out with or something. Anyways, me and my sister ride our bikes there, carry them through the hidden area, and throw them off into some fern bushes right before you get to the forest road. From there, we went down that long trail. The main reason why I was out there was to be sure that no trees had fallen because we had some extra winds the days prior and so we knew that if we needed to bring some bigger saws to cut. And so if we could figure this out then we would know if we would need to bring some bigger saws to cut them. There wasn't any damage but around a week later a tree did end up blocking the end of the trail ironically. Also it's probably important that I mention that it was a pretty rainy day that day. So, we were there for around 10 minutes while I showed my sister the trail, when all of a sudden I get this call from my mum telling me that my brother was asking where we were since he was going to come and find me. I guess he had a change of plans or something, but me being lazy, I told my sister to go walk back down and wait outside the trail entrance on the neighbourhood to wait for him. This would also give me the opportunity to do some work while she was doing this. I called her every few minutes or so since my brother should have arrived, but he hadn't at that point. About 10 minutes go by, so she's been waiting for about a good 20 minutes, when my mum called me again telling me that he had returned and couldn't find us. At this point, I was kind of annoyed, but I called my sister telling her to come back down, and to make sure nobody was around or following her for when she entered the trail, as to not give our spot away. I was waiting from anywhere between 7 to 10 minutes when I was wondering what was taking her so long. So when I walked over to the end of the forest road and I saw her walking all the way on the other side, I was kind of relieved. She wasn't walking on the forest road yet, but she was perpendicular to it, walking towards it. From this angle, the bushes go from anywhere between hip to shoulder height, and so I could see her upper body with her hood on. This is when I realized that I didn't remember her wearing a white sweatshirt or windbreaker. And once the person turned the corner, I could tell that it was not her at all, and was actually likely a grown man. I quickly backpedaled off to the side and down the hill a little bit behind a tree so I could call my sister. I was wondering where she was and if she had gotten lost because, after all, it's pretty hard to get to. I also didn't want this person to steal our bikes and... Uh, did I forget to mention my bike was over $2,000? Don't worry, I made it worth it for how much I ended up riding it, but... It also was going to last a lifetime if properly maintained. Anyway, with my worries about my bike in mind, I called my sister and the second that I heard the first ring... I heard a voice on the other side of the tree that I was hiding behind say, what are you doing? It was my sister. I quickly told her to get down as to not be seen by the person. I didn't want them to find the trail that we were building as I didn't want to get into any sort of trouble and I also wanted to keep it hidden. I also wanted to get back to the bikes and she could tell by the panic in my voice that I was serious and when I told her that there was a person and she looked... She said, no, there isn't. I peeked over and sure enough, nobody was there now. But I knew what I saw though, and so we made our way back, walking past where I saw the person. I was really worried the bikes would be gone by this point, so we trekked through the mud and my heart was absolutely pumping. 
and during this time I just couldn't help the feeling of being watched. I could feel the adrenaline rush and I almost knew that they were off in the trees watching us. I was so distracted thinking that they were going after the bikes when I saw them disappear that I didn't even think that they would be hiding. Thankfully, as we made our way down the trail while acting as calmly as possible, we arrived to see the bikes which were still indeed there. At one point, it did look like there was a different shoe print though because it was slightly larger and differently shaped but it was hard to tell in this area. Now, we made our way all the way back and while I constantly looked behind me making sure that we weren't being followed, I could have sworn that I heard things and saw things out there in the forest. Towards the end, where the trail splits off and leads to the neighborhood, there's a short but wide wooden bridge which is covered in dirt. Thankfully, since it was raining and you could easily see footprints, I could see the extra pair. You could vividly see my first set of footprints to get to the trail, as well as my sister's, with an additional set of her footprints going back and then returning, and then a shoe print on top of hers showing that it was most recent. This confirmed my sighting. My heart dropped once again and we quickly got out of there, still making sure that nobody else was behind us. When I got home, I didn't hesitate to tell my parents who only told me that the next time that I need to be with her at all times. I could tell that they partly didn't believe me or thought that I was just over exaggerating or something. All these questions though went through my head. On one side, we live in a pretty nice neighborhood and even if it was a random person who didn't live there, why were they there? If they were maybe worried about why a random little girl was wandering off in the trails, why did they even bother following? And when they did, why so far behind and so creepily? Why not call out? If it was a worker, why were they wearing what they were wearing? Wouldn't there have been boot prints? Wouldn't they be wearing a vest or a helmet? A truck parked outside the trail. Wouldn't they have something else with them? And why hide like that? If they thought that she was alone originally and they walked past two bikes, why didn't they keep going? It wasn't until they must have seen her talking to me or just saw me when they hid. Why did I feel like I was being watched when I was under the assumption the person was off stealing my bike and not even near us anymore? Why the footprints entering but no going back? Why is someone hiking in an area like this in that attire? How did they even find the area by themselves? They definitely found it because of my sister and when they did, they followed? When they saw how hard it was to navigate, why keep going? Why feel the need to hide from two younger kids as well? And most importantly, what would have happened if I wasn't there at that point? Anyways... I feel the need to explain some more details too because the footprints were maybe half an inch to an inch bigger than my shoes. My shoes were smaller at the time since they were beaters but regardless, my guess is that this person was anywhere from two inches shorter than me to two inches taller. I never got a good look at their face but they were definitely white or had lighter skin. I'm going to be honest and tell you that the person wasn't huge or massive trying to make it sound more scary than what it is, but they definitely did fill out their sweatshirt or coat, so they were pretty stocky, but definitely much bigger than me at the time as well. At this point in time, I believe I was around 5 foot 8 and maybe 130 pounds, so pretty small. It's also important to note that, I don't know, maybe the person was innocent, but the whole situation seemed very fishy. And like I said, I always wonder exactly what would have happened to my sister if I wasn't there that day. I grew up in the early 90s in a small town. During the warm summer days, my father would often make me turn off the TV and go outside to play. We lived in a house on a cul-de-sac, but a few lots didn't have houses built on them yet, so there weren't many neighbors or any kids my age to play with. 
so I was often left to find ways to entertain myself while playing outside. I vividly remember on two different occasions being visited by a strange man who resembled looking kind of like a hippie. He was about six feet tall, slender with long brown hair and a beard. I had to have been between the ages of five or seven during this time. On the first occasion, I was playing outside in my inflatable kiddie pool. I decided that it was time to put the inflatable pool away so I could switch to a different activity. My dad didn't allow us to switch activities until we put away our toys, so leaving the inflatable pool in the front yard just wasn't an option. And there I was at about six years old, on my front porch struggling to deflate this extra large seven foot blow up kiddie pool when this strange guy started walking towards me. I was close enough to the front door of the house where if I had to scream for help someone would have heard me so I didn't feel too afraid by his approach. He greeted me though and explained to me that if I squeezed the rubber nozzle part of the inflatable pool then the air would escape more easily. He gently took the kiddie pool from me, deflated it, folded it up neatly, handed it back to me with two hands and then slowly just walked away. Obviously, that was a bit weird, but about a year had gone by and I was out playing again, this time riding my bike. At some point, my chain had popped off my bike, so I walked my bike around to the backyard in the shade so I could try and put the bike chain back on into the gears. About ten minutes later, I saw that same hippie guy walking down the driveway into my backyard. My first thought was... How did he know that I was even back here? My second thought was, why is he so comfortable walking into our backyard with my dad in front of the yard mowing grass? Most neighbors were intimidated by my father's large size or our big Great Dane, so his confidence in trespassing intrigued me. He greeted me again the same like before, then knelt down eye level to me on the opposite side of my bike and proceeded to reset the chain on my bike. I thanked him for his help, and he strolled off again. Later on that day during dinner, I questioned my father about the man who had walked into our yard and helped me to fix my bike. I figured my father had known the stranger since he allowed him to walk into the backyard to help me fix my bike like that. But my father told me that that was impossible because he had been in the front yard all day doing yard work and washing cars and he would have seen anyone approaching the house since we lived on a cul-de-sac. I also confessed that it wasn't my first time meeting this man and he had helped me out last summer with my kiddie pool. My father had a look of discomfort on his face and asked me what the guy looked like. It was a small town and everybody knew everyone but he could not figure out who this guy could have been. My dad instructed me not to talk to strangers and to alert him if I saw the guy approaching our home ever again. But after that, I never saw the strange guy again. Fast forward to recently a few weeks ago, I was talking to a close friend and randomly remembered those two visits from my childhood and shared the story with my close friend. After a few laughs, my friend asked me what exactly did the strange guy look like to see if he had seen anyone that resembled him on any crime documentaries. I explained to him that the guy honestly looked like a white Jesus dressed in a linen button-up shirt and leather sandals. We laughed a bit more about the whole thing and really, that was it. This takes place some years ago in France. We wanted to camp with my family during summer holidays and so we took our motor home. There was my father, my mother, my little brother, four years old, and me, ten years old at the time. After traveling for a day, my father looked at the map to find a campsite. Unfortunately, it was full though. It was already getting dark, so we decided to drive again for a bit and found a parking lot with a few motorhomes already there and some trucks. After getting installed and eventually having a bite to eat, we went to bed. For context too, 
There were two beds in the RV, one in the back where my parents sleep and one in the front called the overcab bed where I slept with my brother. At night, my father had the habit to pee outside, in the grass, the forest, etc. And after we went to bed, we chatted a little bit and eventually slept. Now, in the middle of the night, I woke up to hearing some noises like rustling or someone searching for something, so I thought that it was my mother or father. After a few seconds, I decided to see, but it was dark and all I could see is a black silhouette like two meters or six foot five in the living room that opened the door to go out. I immediately thought that it was my father that wanted to pee and go out, so I just went back to sleep. In the morning we all woke up and after having some breakfast, my mother couldn't find her handbag and the bag that we had our camera and photo camera in. And that was the moment that I realized that the silhouette that I saw was not my father, but someone who had broken in and robbed us that night. After explaining to my parents what I saw, we went to the police and they told us that it was a common thing here. We never found out who it was and we lost the bags, but I still get shivers when I think about it 20 years later. I mean, what if I had said something to the man? Would he have fled? Would he have attacked us? Honestly, I think that we were lucky to have just been robbed that night. For my safety, I won't reveal which park system I work for, but it is important to know for this story that I, 19 and female, work a position at a Michigan nature park not entirely dissimilar to that of a park ranger. My job duties usually include manning the entry booth, locking up the buildings at night, etc. And although not a usual duty, sometimes they ask me to walk or take a park vehicle through some of the trails, as I am on the younger side but still have several years of experience at the park. I'm a relatively experienced outdoorsman. Now, I've had some odd things happen to me while on the job that I just cannot quite explain. I'm decently well versed in some areas of the paranormal, and although not entirely relevant, it's of note that I am also a Norse pagan as a part of a family belief, and often wear protective symbols as well. To be honest, I've started wearing them more since these odd things have been happening too. I've tried looking into it myself, but overall I'm overwhelmed and not sure where to look, so a friend suggested that I share this here and, well, maybe get some help. So there are two things in particular that I want to ask about. I usually work the night shift, and this night in particular it was raining a lot and the conditions were getting unsafe. I was posted out in the booth, which is multiple miles from the office, so when things took a turn for the worse, my boss radioed me back. Some people who don't spend a lot of time in the woods, they don't realize how dark and deep the woods can actually get, much less in the dark at night. But I had a flashlight and the light from the booth, which gave me probably 30 feet of visibility. And when I went to grab my stuff so that I could lock up the booth and get to my car... I swore that I saw something that moved very human-like, but moved in a really odd way too. Like, the only way that I can describe it is as if a horse-deer hybrid tried to run like a person. But there were no people out there, and it was most definitely not a deer. I'm probably not describing it in the best way, but whatever it was, it was very off. So I got to my car ASAP, and it didn't start right away, which was a bit odd, but not entirely out of character for my car. But when I turned the key a second time, I saw something out of the corner of my eye, and it looked like whatever it was had gotten closer. The drive goes without incident, but I'm still off about what I saw, and when I get closer, I radio in to see if they need me to pick anyone up. And the radio doesn't work right which was definitely very out of character. I mean, these radios are designed to work in awful conditions, and I was the closest I'd been to any sort of signal in a while. I chalked it up to the weather and pulled into the office. But as I do, 
something runs past me. I didn't get a good look at what it was, but I can assure you that it was not a person. And I'm telling you that there's not an animal in the woods that I know of that looks like either of the things that I saw. And honestly, I just can't seem to shake this. The second thing that I would like to ask about is, this happened more recently and is what prompted me to finally reach out to somewhere like this. I was walking the trails for security purposes close to closing. We close at around 11pm and start a final walk through around 9pm. We do this to make sure that no one's stuck on the trail or hurt so they aren't stuck overnight when there's fewer staff and none that patrol those trails. So I was walking one of our trails and I was pretty deep in the woods already as I'm a fairly fast hiker and this is a trail that I know well as well. I was already about two miles into the trail when things started to get a bit weird. I hear a noise off in the distance and at first I thought it could be a coyote or maybe an owl so I pressed on. Coyotes stay off the trails, won't go after people unless they have dogs and dogs abandon the woods here anyway. And they know when we do our sweep, so I wasn't too concerned. But then the noises got weirder. I'm used to the sounds of the woods and I know the area and the wildlife very well. And I have never once in my life heard that sound before. It didn't come from any animal that I recognize. And it most definitely was not human. I've never aborted a sweep before, even when I've had coyotes nearby, but it just didn't feel right this day and so I got out of there. We're allowed to use our judgement in these cases thankfully, so I didn't get in any trouble, but if anyone has any idea as to what either of these things could be, please let me know and I would really, really appreciate your help. This was around the winter of 2006. I was eight years old at the time and I was living in Thunder Bay, Ontario with my family and we lived by the auditorium and the Canada Games Complex. There was a big hill at the east end of the parking lot that myself and the neighborhood kids would go sledding at. Usually our parents would come but since we were right across the streets, if it was daylight, They'd sometimes let us go out on our own since it was only about 400 meters from the front door. Now one day, a few of us went to the sliding hill. There was four of us, myself and three kids from a big family from down the street. There was the older sister and two of the younger brothers. Everything went as usual until we noticed an old blue Ford F-150. I still remember the rust on the wheel well and the hood... The driver, he just sat there watching us. He was older, mid-40s to 50, dark grey shoulder-length hair and a salt and pepper beard. He was sat there smoking and watching us. We all immediately felt pretty creeped out and didn't take our eyes off of him. I would often watch a lot of crime shows with my mum at that time and I could feel the hair standing on my neck as I knew something was just off. The older sister of the family said that we'll slide down the hill and just walk home as he just kept watching us. But he got out of his truck at one point and started walking toward us and we immediately took off running across the parking lot and he just stood there on the top of the hill smoking and watching us run in a panic. They told their parents and were told not to go back but I for some reason was afraid to tell mine. A few months later... We were driving up the street that we lived on, Beverly Street, and as I was looking out of the window, I got that heavy, dreadful feeling in my body. That was when I saw his truck in the parking lot of the apartments right next to the clinic that my mum would take me to, and the convenience store that I would bike to with some of the older kids in my neighborhood. I never biked up there again, and when I would see the truck driving on the main drag, I'd hide in the bushes or behind the hedges every time. Only once did I see him drive through the neighborhood and it was right before I moved. I was playing in the yard of the kids that I was sliding with that following summer and we all just stood there and watched as he slowed down and glanced out the window, cigarette in his mouth. 
Only a few of us had seen him, and the dread that we felt as he looked over at each of us was indescribable. I moved a few weeks later after that, but I never forgot about that day. I recently in my adult life moved from Manitoba to southern Ontario, and I decided to drive by my old house on the way, but, but when I drove by those apartments, though, I never saw the truck. I don't know why I was looking for it, but I still felt something odd in me. This was a long time ago, so I don't remember my exact age at the time, but I was very young, probably around kindergarten age. My family was living in an old farmhouse that my grandparents lived next door to. The house was built in the 1830s and this was the 1990s so the whole property is over 160 years old and everything definitely looked a bit old and a little bit worn. My experience was during a cold winter night, either late November or early December. The sun is fully set and it's pretty dark. Being out in the countryside, there's not much light at night and it's dead quiet. My mum sent me to my grandparents to return some movies that I had borrowed. It was a pretty short walk, but I had to cross the farm driveway to get there. And that is where my oldest and most vivid memory takes place. I'm a child walking alone at night, even though now I know both my mum and grandma were watching me, so I was pretty scared. Once I got to the farm driveway, I remember feeling just not right. I wasn't exactly scared, but my anxiety was very high. I remember turning to look down at the barns and seeing my dad out in the workshop, and then I turned back to start walking, and that's when I saw the boy and his horse. I remember them so vividly. They had a pale off-white glow, but it didn't emanate from them. You couldn't see light on any of the surroundings, but the boy was wearing dark underwear with suspenders, a white long sleeve shirt, and a hat with a white brim. He was holding the reins of the horse. I don't remember the horse as well as the boy, but I remember that it was fully saddled and looked healthy. I cannot remember the color though. It was either white, brown, or a mix of that, like most horses, unfortunately. It for sure wasn't black though, but he never moved from the spot that they stood. The boy just stared at me while he held the reins. In fact, he didn't blink a single time. He just stared at me, face completely emotionless. I don't remember the moving either, but it was only seconds, but remember being completely frozen when I saw him, too scared to scream. Then I think my fight or flight kicked in because I bolted home and almost broke the door throwing myself inside. The weirdest thing though was when I looked back, they were gone, like they had just disappeared into thin air. I told my parents but they didn't believe me and fast forward 10-ish years, something interesting happens. Same property and my mum is running a daycare out of it at this time and the boy and his horse is just something fun that I tell my friends when they first come over at this point. This time it was daylight and in the morning. A kid was getting dropped off by their parent and all of a sudden they point to that spot and they say, look mummy, a horsey. I didn't see anything when I looked but my mum said that I went super pale and I was pretty freaked out. But I also was kind of excited that somebody else had potentially seen the same thing I did. I'm glad it was less traumatic for that kid though. I had some experiences in that house as well, but I'm almost 100% certain that they were the result of sleep paralysis. The only one that I'm not certain on is one where I watched indentations move around the carpet in my childhood room like someone was walking. But I was also in bed, so still, it could have been sleep paralysis, I admit. I have gone to visit the property since then. My grandma still lives next door, but I haven't seen or heard anything about the boy and his horse since the daycare kids saw them. It still blows my mind just how vividly I can picture that night.
I recently went on vacation with my parents to a resort. And one night, my dad went to bed early while my mum and I sat outside and talked. She is a very reserved woman who keeps many things to herself and likes small talk. So this caught me completely off guard. She was looking up at the sky and seemed like she was thinking hard about something. She suddenly asks me, in Spanish, Do you remember Cousin George? You met him when you were little, but he died not long after. I did remember him a little anyway. I remember going to Cuba with my parents to visit family, and I met my cousin there. I was about eight, I think, and he was very sweet and welcoming, about my dad's age. He asked me so many questions about life in the US and played games with me. After a while, he went over to the adults and suddenly he became sort of hysterical, crying and hyperventilating, yelling things that I couldn't understand at the time. It scared me, so I remember hiding, but that was really all that I remember of him. My mum proceeded to tell me what she remembers of him. This took place in Havana, where they're from. My mum said he was a completely normal person. We used to spend a lot of time together because he lived next door. He was about 10 years older than me, but he took me everywhere, running errands, hanging out with his friends. He helped people with housework and with livestock. There was never anything odd about him. Everyone loved him. Then, when I was about 7 or 8, he was 17 or 18, he had to do his mandatory military service, as every male did in Cuba. At first, he wrote me letters, but after a few months, those stopped. He would only write to his mother, and I overheard her talking to my mum and grandma, Hilda, about how something about his letters just didn't seem right. And then the letters stopped altogether. One day... I was at my aunt's, Georges' mum's, and there is a knock at our door. I answered it, and there were two men in military uniforms. My aunt and my grandma hurried towards the door and told me to go away. I hid behind the hallway wall and listened. I couldn't hear everything, but the men said that cousin Georges was unwell and he was being sent back home. A couple of weeks later... Sure enough, Cousin George gets sent back, escorted by another young soldier who was his friend. Grandma later told me that his friend had quietly let them know that Cousin George had apparently been in a submarine with the Russians, no idea where, and that while he was down there, he saw something and immediately went haywire. After that, he was very different. Like, he'd be acting completely normally, and then randomly go into hysterics, screaming nonsense, crying, throwing things. He also refused to talk about his military service. One day when I was 16, someone in the neighborhood gave me my first Bible. I was really excited to receive it too. We didn't have much of anything, so being given a Bible as a gift was really exciting. I came home with it and Cousin George was there. He saw it and stared at it in my hands for a moment. He then stood up and walked over to me, grabbed the Bible from my hands, and flipped to the first chapter. He then said, Genesis, the first great lie. The way that he said it terrified me though, and I grabbed the Bible back in case he'd try to destroy it. He didn't follow me when I left, but I could hear him having another meltdown after this. Cousin George, he never recovered. He ended up becoming extremely religious later in life, but still had frequent episodes and delusions. He passed in the early 2010s from a heart attack, unfortunately. My mum adored him, and I know that that hurt her badly to see him suddenly change like that. I could see the pain in her eyes as she told me all of this, staring off into the night sky as she spoke. I have a couple of theories, though, about what may have happened. One, he may have been subjected to psychological experiments at the hands of the Cubans and or Russian military that led him to lose his mind. Two, he may have developed a mental illness later in life. I remember reading that schizophrenia often comes around in males in their early 20s. The stress of military service, maybe that could have triggered an underlying mental illness. Or three... 
he really did see something that made him snap. But what could it have been? If anyone else has any theories, then genuinely, I would love to hear them. I am a registered nurse, and in my career of floor nursing, I have many stories, as I am sure that many nurses do. But one that always comes to mind is this. It was an older woman that, at the end of the shift, interrupted me while I was checking in on her. As she raised her shaky hand, pointing in my direction, she said, Could you please tell him to leave? I turned around just the empty corner of the room behind me and said, Who? Dead serious, she repeated, Him, tell him to leave. I don't like him. I thought that this was strange as she wasn't a psych patient, no history of hallucinations or anything. So I replied, uh, Ma'am, there's no one there. It's just you and I in the room. She kept staring in the corner no, there's a man in the corner wearing a dark hood. Tell him to leave. Well, I finished my shift pretty much then and there and I went home. I came back the next week and that patient was no longer in that room. After inquiring from co-workers, I found out that she had passed away two days after the night that she told me about the man in the hood in her room. And for whatever reason... I still get chills when I think about it. As I've been listening to some of the stories here, I remembered this night from about eight years ago. It was after 11pm and I was taking my dogs out for their last toileting walk before bed. At the time, I was living in a rural area, houses farther apart, Lots of wooded area, and lots around with wild pigs often crossing our path. I would often take long walks because one of the dogs had a problem with having accidents in the morning if he hadn't had an adequate walk to do all of his business. It was dark, so I had the flashlight and really wasn't expecting to meet anyone. I mean, especially in the middle of nowhere, so late at night, but there, appeared on the opposite side of the road ahead, was another flashlight. We had few neighbors, but of the homes around, I knew most of all of them from the years. On rare occasion, somebody else may be walking a dog, but I could count the instances on my fingers. As I passed the other flashlight in the night, a tall, thin, pale man, who I had never seen before, crossed the street to my side and began to follow behind me. He yelled out, Hey, I like your dogs, can I pet them? I stayed calm, walking briskly, ignoring him. My house was close and I was almost home at the end of the walk. He continued to follow, yelling, Hey, what's your name? I just want to pet your dogs. He had a, a thick European or Slavic accent. I ignored him and ran up into my house through the door, locked it and ran into my bedroom. I told my husband that there was a strange man who followed me home and that I was super disturbed that he knows where I live now. My brave husband immediately ran out of the house, I guess to find this guy. I was on pins and needles waiting for him to come back. He came back home with his steel baseball bat in hand. He said that he caught up to him and asked who the heck he was, and why he was following around a woman at basically midnight being a creep. The guy said that he was new in town, and he was walking around hoping to meet or make some new friends. Basically, his story was bizarre and totally didn't make any sense. My husband, he told me that if he ever sees him again near our home, he was going to break his knees with the baseball bat. But after that, I never saw him again. Until two years later in a neighboring city. I was out with a girlfriend looking at art in a museum when I turned the corner and suddenly it was him. I would never forget his face. He looked straight at me and I can't remember exactly what he said, but he knew who I was from that night. Something like, oh, you're the girl from that night with the dogs. I don't remember because I was just sort of in disbelief, but again, with the thick European accent, tall, skinny, pale, 
I grabbed my friend's arm and quickly walked in the opposite direction. She asked me, do you know that creepy guy? And I told her the story as we left the museum. Thankfully after that, I never did see him again. What are the odds though of this being a coincidence? Pretty unlikely, right? The first time I ever played with a Ouija board was when I was about 11. It was me and two of my friends. Their names were Katie and Taylor. Katie's older sister, Lauren, and her friend, Sam, had us come upstairs. Lauren and Sam had a talking board. Basically, it was a super girly looking Ouija board with a kitty on it. Katie, Taylor, and I laughed but said, okay, sure. We all put our fingers on the piece and it pretty quickly started moving across the board and it spelled out run. My friends and I freaked out and yanked our hands back. Lauren and Sam busted out laughing. They said that they had moved it to just scare us. Katie started yelling at them as they continued to laugh at us but it was about that time the bathroom light turned off. It made us all jump as it was the only light that we had on and then it turned back on. Taylor spoke up and said, okay, you got us, we're done. But Lauren and Sam seemed genuinely spooked at this point. And then the planchette started to move towards me on its own. At this point, Katie, Taylor, Lauren, and Sam are all standing together opposite me. I say, haha, very funny. I saw that coming from a mile away. But when I looked at Lauren and Sam, all I saw was pure fear. They had no color in their faces and were just sort of staring at the planchette, wide-eyed. Sam finally spoke up in a very shaky voice and said, No, that's not us. And then Lauren very calmly said, Guys, go now. We all took off downstairs and out the front door. Taylor and Katie started yelling again, saying, If that was you guys, cut it out and tell us the truth. But by now, Lauren and Sam were on the verge of tears and hyperventilating. That was when I glanced up to the bedroom window. I saw the light in the bathroom turn off and then that's when I saw a small black figure about my size sprint past the window. Nobody else was in the house though. Lauren and Katie's older brothers were off both at college and their dad was still at work and their mum had to run to the store and wasn't back yet. Katie and Taylor, they slept over at my house that night, and Lauren slept over with Sam. We never spoke about that experience to each other ever again after that, but it wasn't long after that incident that Katie, Taylor, and I, we had a big falling out. I haven't seen or spoken to Taylor since. It's been about 18 years. Katie and I reconnected a few years ago on Instagram and chat every now and then, but we still never talk about that night. In 2018, I moved into a small two-story property in England with my then boyfriend. It was in a quiet cul-de-sac with houses literally crammed together, all facing each other. I am very introverted and I don't typically make a habit of socializing much with neighbors. Still, we naturally ran into a few and exchanged pleasantries when we had to, as you would, right? Now, one of our new neighbors, Greg, was incredibly welcoming right off the bat. He was an older gentleman, the kind that who would stop for a chat that would drag on and on until you made up an excuse for why you really had to get going. He shared local stories, asked about and took note of our birthdays, and even invited us around for a garden party where any and all were welcome. His house was directly across the street from where I lived, with his windows in clear view of mine. A couple of years passed by, and during this time, my boyfriend and I split up. Although I never expressly shared this news with my neighbors, word must have gotten around with his car missing from the driveway. He moved out and left the country in the end, but we stayed in touch regularly as friends. Having the house to myself felt, well, lonely, so I got a cat to keep me company. 
He quickly became, and still is, my world. Greg would often flag me down to talk when he caught me leaving or returning to my house. Annoying, but I could live with it, I suppose. I'd update my ex about weird little interactions with Greg, which we both found amusing to gossip about. But one such incident was when Greg came to my door to hand over two of my parcels, one of which was a large table that he had yet to retrieve from his house. I had been raiding in Elder Scroll Online at the time, doing a deathless speedrun for an achievement. Given the time constraint in my game, I told him that I'd leave the door unlocked so that he could simply put it by my door. I sat back down at my desk, put my headset on, and my group charged in at the final boss. I heard my front door opening, followed by the sound of my large parcel being placed down. But then, footsteps approached me from behind. I peered behind me to see Greg standing there, eyes sort of fixed on me. For fear of disappointing my raid group, I continued playing until we killed the boss, and then took off my headset. Greg's face lit up, and he went on to tell me how amazing it was to watch me play. I got the impression that he'd never seen someone use a keyboard, let alone play games. He begged me to teach him and rambled on. He was clearly intoxicated, so I laughed it off and gave a non-committal response. Despite repeated attempts to politely make him leave, he could not be persuaded. He seemed disappointed when I walked over to my door and opened it to clearly signal that it was time to go, but he left without further incident. In the UK, houses often have individual outdoor bins for trash, which have to be rolled out to the street the night before collections take place. You're expected to bring the bins back to your property after collection, and I noticed someone kept bringing my bins back in for me. Was I blocking someone's car by being too slow to do it? Around the same time, I also noticed someone had been using my bins. I brought it up to Greg one time he pulled me over to talk and he said the same thing had been happening to him. Maybe it was petty of me, but I decided to tape an old phone with a surveillance app to my window, overlooking the bins to figure out who it was. And lo and behold, it was Greg. I chalked it up to him having run out of bin space after the local council moved from weekly to bi-weekly collections due to staffing issues. And although it bothered me, my desire to avoid confrontation won in the end. Christmas rolled around, and the COVID-19 pandemic was in full swing at this point. But one late evening, I heard a knock at my door and walked over to see who it was. I had no peephole, so I opened the door not knowing what to expect. Greg stood at my doorstep, which was not particularly unusual. I'd gotten all too used to his antics but I immediately caught a strong waft of alcohol. He spoke before I had time to process. He told me that he had a Christmas present for me and handed over a red gift bag with colored tissue paper covering the contents. I really want to give you a kiss on the cheek, but I can't, not with this pandemic going around, he said. That gave me the heebie-jeebies, so I did all I could to politely end this interaction and retreat back inside. He held me up by rambling on about, well, who knows what to be honest, but I firmly told him that I was busy and I needed to go. That's when he laid a hand on my shoulder, leaned in, kissed my cheek, and then walked off in the direction of his house. I closed the door and simply stood there for a few moments in shock. The present was odd too. Underneath the tissue paper were two bottles of Belgian beer, a can of half-eaten Pringles, sour cream and onion, and a small plastic bag containing little chocolates. I also recognized the latter item. A next-door neighbor with young children had come around to put these plastic bags with chocolate and a handwritten note, signed with their address, through everyone's mail slots a few weeks prior. It was a sweet gesture and probably something they came up with to keep the stir-crazy kids busy, but upon inspecting the re-gifted chocolates, I noticed that he'd even forgotten to remove the note from the neighbor. This kiss and gift, it definitely gave me bad vibes, and I regretted accepting it. 
It was at this point too that I decided that I was done being mispolite and resolved to be firm in my future rejections. Now, on the second day of the new year, I was feeling lazy and ordered food delivery. A mere five minutes after receiving my order, there was a knock at my door. Knowing that the delivery driver hadn't forgotten anything, I concluded that this had to be Greg. And then it clicked for me. He'd often turn up immediately after anything was delivered to my door, which meant that he was constantly watching my house. Was he dumping trash in my bins as an excuse to hang around my house? He called out for me through the door. I felt too uncomfortable to answer and I retreated upstairs out of view from the windows. Later that night, he came back and kept knocking too. But once again, I ignored it in hopes of him going away. The following day, I contacted the police to file a harassment report. I felt sheepish doing so. I mean, was it really that bad? He was just a lonely old man and I hadn't been firm enough probably. Upon being asked whether I wanted the police to speak with him, I told them that I'd do it myself. I just wanted the report on file in case anything else actually happened. I would later become grateful for filing this report, by the way. Greg turned up at my door a few days later, telling me how worried he was about me. I told him, verbatim, I think it's best if we don't have any contact going forward. His response was eerie. I just wanted to be your friend. I held my ground cut the conversation short and closed the door. Finally, it's over, I thought. And a year went by without incident. Everything seemed fine with no knocks on the door or unwanted conversations while I was outside. One night in winter, I was leaving my house to get groceries. It was completely dark outside, save for a lamppost casting some sparse light into the street. My driveway was at the side of my house where the bins were stored. This driveway was blocked in by a tall panel fence to add some privacy, seeing as the kitchen window was directly next to it. You could see right into my kitchen and living room through this window. As I was outside locking the door, that was when I saw a figure in the dark slinking out of my driveway and behind the fence. I immediately unlocked the door and went back inside. It was dark, I could have imagined it, but my gut told me otherwise. Was there someone waiting for me behind the fence? Ultimately, I trusted my instincts and decided to forego the groceries for the night. I bought and mounted a motion sensor light to illuminate my driveway too. The memory of the shadowy figure quickly faded in my mind, and the new light gave me some comfort that I'd at least be alerted if someone was lurking outside of my window. A couple of months after the incident, I was in my kitchen getting some food for my beloved cat, the window was directly to my left, around three feet away from where I stood. As I dumped the cat food into a bowl, I suddenly became aware of my motion sensor light being on. I scanned the outside, not seeing anything, until my I landed on something in the bottom corner of the window. I squinted, trying to make out what I was looking at. It somehow wasn't properly illuminated. I kept staring for what must have been 30 seconds. The light outside remained on. When suddenly, Greg pops up into view, directly outside. He'd been crouched down, peering in from the corner of the window. I'm normally someone who's as cool as a cucumber. I never raise my voice or yell, but I truly lost it at that moment, screaming, what are you doing, repeatedly. He just stood there. And then nonchalantly asked, are you all right? I kept screaming, but now it was, why are you there? Then he just turned around and walked off into the dark. I immediately called the police. Typically, the police in England leave something to be desired, but I have to give them credit for how they handled this situation. They took my statement over the phone and gave me a reference number. I received a couple of phone calls with updates and was told that they'd bring him to the station. I was also informed that he was known to the police for having previously followed young women. Sometime later, 
He was arrested at his property in front of a wife that I didn't even know existed. They did this to scare him, according to the officer that I spoke to, to make a bit of a point. Sadly, he received nothing more than a police caution, which forbade him from being on my side of the cul-de-sac or contacting me. Still, it seemed to work. The window incident was the last real interaction that I ever had with Greg. I did see him staring at me in the shower from his window one time when I forgot to close the blinds, but other than that, really there was nothing else. Thankfully too, I have since moved far away from Greg, which I am very, very grateful for. I was between three and five years old, so it was around 1989 to 1991. My room was on the complete opposite end of the house from my parents' bedroom, and I'd wake up in the middle of the night on a regular basis, scared. When I'd wake up, I remember seeing this woman standing at the end of my bed. I could kind of see through her, but she also put off a glow. It was a warm, loving, welcoming, and peaceful glow. She was also wearing a blue tunic and a white headdress. She was always looking down, holding and happily comforting a baby wrapped in a blanket. But after a few seconds of having my eyes open, she'd always notice that I was awake and would act surprised, like I wasn't supposed to see her. Then she'd immediately disappear. I never felt threatened by her. I remember the first time that I saw her, I really didn't know what to think and I pulled my sheets over my head before she disappeared. She really did give off an aura that was comforting, welcoming. The glow coming off of her felt like that, like I knew that I was completely safe while sleeping. This happened quite a few times too, to the point that I'd smile when I saw her after waking up, and she'd look back with a smile that was comforting, yet at the same time also conveyed something like, you aren't actually supposed to be seeing me, while still intentionally letting me see her for a few seconds before fading away. She felt like a very, I don't know, familiar mother figure, but it wasn't my mother. I was always scared right after she disappeared though, because that safe feeling would disappear as well, and I'd want to run to my parents' bedroom. I could see my parents' bedroom from the doorway of my room, but... You had to walk through the dining room and living room to get to it. But there were also always these strange shadowy figures, dozens of them walking around in the dining room, kitchen and living room. I remember being very scared of them, but I never actually drew their attention while I stood there, watching them from my bedroom doorway, and they never really seemed to notice me or walk toward me too. It seemed that they were always in a hurry though, walking with busy intent but never actually going anywhere. I was always scared of them, even more scared that I'd actually draw their attention, but I wanted the comfort of my parents. I was too scared to run through the shadow people that were walking around, so I'd always scream for my parents from my bedroom doorway. The instant that I would scream, the shadow people would stop walking, then all of them would look up at me with an angry and frustrated aura but never actually took a step towards me. They'd just disappear about the time that I'd hear either of my parents' voices as my mom or dad walked toward me. One of the last times that I saw the lady at the end of my bed and the shadow people, I wanted to get to my parents' room where they were, but instead of just calling out for them, I just closed my eyes and held out my hands to feel my way across the dining room and living room to my parents' bedroom. I actually made it there on my own. Even with my eyes closed, I could feel them there before they started to disappear, but I could also feel as they were fading away that they were angry because I wasn't as scared of them anymore. I stopped seeing them shortly after that, which was also around the time that I started feeling more comfortable staying in my own bed all night by myself without needing to have my parents close by. But it's one of the most real and vivid memories that I can remember from when I was that age. I'm 38 now and I still remember exactly what the lady looked like and felt like and the shadow people too. This 
wasn't even an old house or anything though that you'd really associate with a stereotypical haunted place. It was actually a relatively new double wide trailer that my mum and dad had put there a few years before I was born. They bought the trailer brand new directly from the manufacturer and I feel like what I saw and felt had to be real though because a three to five year old wouldn't have been able to imagine that physical feeling from her aura that was so welcoming. It was a distinct physical feeling that a three to five year old wouldn't have been able to just randomly imagine. A feeling that I still somehow remember. I never did see anything like that again in that place or any other place that I've lived. I haven't experienced anything paranormal since and I don't know whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. I work at a condo complex by the beach. I've been here for about three years and my co-workers, who have been here for 10 plus years, always talk about seeing and hearing spooky stuff. To give you some background, I'm a skeptical believer. In the past three years, I've never had anything happen that I couldn't debunk. Until tonight, that is. I have a radio that I carry with me when there are two of us working. Normally, I'm here by myself, so I don't usually have it on me, but this night I did. While waiting in the lobby of the second floor for the elevator, the radio suddenly kicked on, like someone was trying to talk. I took it out of my pocket and heard a faint little girl's voice saying, Can you see me? twice, followed by, I'm right behind you. My initial thought was that my co-workers were playing a joke on me, so I just put the radio back in my pocket. When I got back to the guard shack, I told my co-worker that it was a funny prank. He looked at me though, and he's not the type to lie, and said that he had no clue what I was talking about. So apparently I had my first paranormal experience. I spoke to my boss this morning too and told him what happened. He wasn't surprised as well, and said it normally happens on the sixth floor. He mentioned that he has seen and heard two little kids running up and down the hallways and that they have messed with the radio before. He asked around, but no one knows anything about any kids passing away here. However, this building has been here since 1974 and was one of the first condos built in this area. This is more of my dad's story than mine, but I still think that it's good to share it. In August of 06, my family was stationed at Fort Riley in Kansas. We moved into this gorgeous duplex at the end of a horseshoe-shaped neighborhood. The house was built in the early 1900s and had an unfinished basement with these pool lights that only light up this small area around you. In the basement, there were also these really small boot prints in the cement that looked as if they belonged to a child. The house had a grand staircase that only went to and from the ground floor to the second floor, and a back staircase which went to all four floors, originally intended for servants. The ground floor held main living areas, and my brother and I were on the second. I snagged the master, which had its own doorbell. For a six-year-old, this was awesome, but probably obnoxious. My parents, they stayed on the top floor, which had an unfinished attic room that held pieces of original furniture. A babysitter once joked that vampires lived in there. Anyway, about a month after moving in, a woman knocked on the door and introduced herself as part of the historical society and asked for my family's permission for this home to be featured in the annual Halloween ghost tour, informing us that this is a usual stop. She let us know that this home was host to a spirit called the Buckskin Ghost, as he appears as a man in buckskin clothing. We informed her that we were new and hadn't had any paranormal experiences. She asked how long we'd been here for. My dad said about a month, to which she replies, Oh, usually he shows himself by now. My dad politely declined to be on the tour. 
I think my parents either didn't believe or were a little bit scared, but we were still unpacking things at this point too, mostly boxes which were in the garage, which was attached to the back stairwell near the basement. Now, Dad noticed the light in the garage was out and went to go and change it. Completely normal thing. As my dad is reaching up to change the light, it comes back on though. He makes sure that it's screwed in all the way, climbs down the ladder and puts it away. When he returns to the garage, the light is out. Confused, my dad fetched the ladder again. He returns. The light's back on though. Frustrated, he moves the ladder out of the way. The light goes off. So he sets up the ladder, climbs up and as he's reaching up to change the light, it comes back on again. My dad is beyond frustrated now and yells, stop messing with me. The light comes back on and doesn't go out the entire time that we live there. This was our introduction to the next 10 months. Other odd things happened in the home, like the radio turning on to a static station extremely loudly, and there were rooms in the basement our dog just would never go in. Anytime anything would happen, we would refer to Bucky acting up. While we lived there, we learned more about the base's haunted history too. We even purchased a book of the ghost stories which included our home. This book also featured a story of a little girl who befriended a ghost who would play dolls with them. When that family moved out, the girl left her doll at the house for her friend. Now, remember the original furniture that was in the attic? When we first moved in, we looked in all the drawers, and in one of those drawers, there was that doll. One that I didn't learn anything about until months later. I don't know what happened to the doll, but I only ever saw it once. For the most part, nothing too terrifying happened in the house, up until my dad stayed by himself. My dad was a night pilot, meaning that he usually slept during the day. And one day, he was woken up by the sound of heavy footsteps coming up the stairs at the base level. My dad got up and opened the door and asked if anyone was there. And immediately, the noise stops. My dad went to check the window overlooking the street to see if a service van was at the house or something. For those who haven't lived on a military base, they occasionally send people to the home to do things like change air filters and all that. My dad... Didn't see anything though, and so he went back to bed. But he was awoken again to the sound of heavy footsteps on what he perceived as the second floor. My dad shot out of bed, went to the door, and as soon as he opened the door, the noises, they stopped. He yells again, is anyone there? No response. So he goes and he lays back down. My dad then hears items of furniture moving in the room opposite the wall in front of the bed, the one with the original furniture items. He jumps out of bed and leaves the house without a second thought at this point, and it wasn't until he was at work later that he realized that he would be going back to the home alone, and questioned what was in that home with him. I was six when all of this went down and for years we have talked about these experiences and others that have happened to their friends and family. We've continued to check for more stories online about this house. Others have also experienced a friendly but mischievous ghost affectionately called Bucky. I've had other strange experiences throughout my life and I believe this house is what opened me up to them. I'm now dating a man who is very much a skeptic. And while visiting my home in Florida, my dad told him this story. Weirdly too, the light in the kitchen was flickering throughout this retelling. Jokingly, my boyfriend yells, stop messing with me, when it flickers off. The light immediately then turned on and continued to stay on while he visited. You can look up the ghost of 85B Schofield Circle, Fort Riley, Kansas if you would like too. There are plenty of stories from the base that deserve to be heard, including this one, and I encourage those who have made it this far to do some additional research on this haunted military base. And if you live in this house, please let Bucky's story be told on that ghost tour.
This happened to me when I was about 21 years old. So my friends and I went into a local cemetery one night to check out the train grave, which was the grave of a man who died in the 1960s while working on a train. There is a piece of a train on his grave marker, a coupler I think, that is what it looks like anyway, and we walked over to it, heard a train whistle from the tracks a quarter mile or so away, and got a little bit spooked, but we weren't spooked enough to actually leave. It was just sort of coincidental, I suppose. So, we're all wandering around, and my grandfather happens to be buried in this cemetery too. Where the road split, they all wanted to go to the right, but I knew that my grandpa's grave was to the left. I told everyone that I would catch up with them in a minute. I just wanted to check if he still had flowers on his grave, and if not, I'd go and pick some up the next day. There's a small, evergreen tree beside my grandpa's grave, roughly seven feet tall, or maybe a little bit taller. And as I walked up to where I knew that he was buried, I suddenly became very confused. Because there were two trees there. I stopped walking about 75 yards from the grave itself, trying to figure out when they planted a second tree. When the second tree took a step forward toward me. At that, I booked it and ran back the way that I came, convinced the whole time that something was about to grab me from behind. My friends, they got to the car shortly after me and I told them about what happened and they said that they noped out because one of them saw a deer that looked solid black. What I had seen had to have been at least the height of the other tree though and looked plenty tree-like up until it took that step forward. It was super dark, so I didn't get the best look at it, but whatever it was, I wasn't about to stick around to find out. I went back in the daytime the next day with some flowers, and I can confirm that there was only one tree by my grandpa's grave. This story is actually my grandfather's, and after he told it to me, it's always stuck with me. He liked traveling when he was in his 20s with his friends, and happened to work in Saudi Arabia at that time. He was on his way from Jordan to Saudi Arabia by car with one of his best friends. Now, if you don't know, going from an Arab country to another in a car is a pretty common way that people traveled back in the days, 1970s and 80s. They started their journey at 12 p.m. and they first entered the Saudi lands at 6 p.m. or something. Which, by the way, at that time and still today, is a fully deserted road. All you see around you is sand. But nowadays, it's more merciful, so there are some buildings and all that. You know, just to keep people safe along the way. Anyway, for context, it takes about 30 plus hours to travel from Jordan to Saudi Arabia specifically a city called Dammam that is far to the east of the country. And here is where it gets real interesting. It was after sunset. My grandpa and his friend, they both wanted to stop and take some rest, possibly sleep. And back in those days, there used to be these sort of rooms, like literally just a room in the middle of the desert for travelers to use for sleep and rest. And that's exactly what my grandpa and his friend did. Now, this room had no door, no furniture or anything. Literally, it was just an empty room with a dune probably surrounding it from all sides. It was maybe about 7pm at the time that they stopped the car and set their stuff out. And they were making tea, only to hear this hissing voice of a woman coming from one of the dunes. So, apparently they had the courage to go out and check it out. They walked into the sand until they were beside this dune, and yes, a woman was there. As what my grandpa described, she wore a black dress that fully covered her body, and her hair was really messy and had red, brown, and orange streaks. Her back was to them, and by literal words, she said, get out of here, it's not your place. Now, this was weird enough, but it doesn't end here because my grandpa wanted to mess around apparently and he asked for her name and she answered with Baduria or something like that. I'm bad with names so I can't remember exactly so you'll have to excuse me but 
She also introduced herself as a member of Jin. Now, if you don't know anything about the term Jin, basically that means demon. And at this, of course, my grandpa and his friend, they took that as a sign to immediately leave. So they left, but when they turned around, this woman was just gone. They gathered their belongings quickly back into the car, and they drove until dawn. I'm from Southeast Asia, and a little more than 15 years ago, when I was about seven, I lived at my very first house, which eventually became haunted by not just one, but many paranormal entities. You could say a mass haunting, I suppose. It was an apartment type house. My mother and father hadn't gotten divorced yet. My dad had a friend who was a druggie and would come over to either play video games with my dad or just have a safe place to use. We were all close to him and he was a nice guy actually. It was pretty sad that he was using to be honest. One night though, he came banging on our front door and he looked really freaked out. Apparently, he went deep into a forest nearby our house to use and he said that while he was using, he saw a Pontianac. A little info about this entity. Long hair covered face, white clothed. If you hear her far away, it means that she's near. If you hear her near, it means that she's actually far away, which is a tactic to lure people. Some people either hear her hum a song, cry, sounds exactly like the witch in Left 4 Dead by the way, or laugh in a super high pitched voice which kind of sounds like a bird, except that no bird in the world sounds like that. She also floats or sort of flies instead of walking. Anyway, while my dad's friend was using in the forest, apparently he saw the entity and it chased him. Stupidly, our house was the first place that he ran to. My parents opened the door and they let him in. Obviously, at the time, they didn't know whether this was just some sort of drug-induced hallucination or what, but they took him in anyway and they helped him out. But a few days later, creepy things started to happen at my apartment level. Our windows were opaque and some nights we would see a tall woman with long hair and white clothes pass by the window without any footsteps heard. And honestly, it looked more like she was floating past. One of the neighbors had a dog and some nights in the AMs would bark furiously. The neighbor said that she saw it standing in her house too while her dog was barking at it and it did nothing but stand there. My other neighbors saw it in their houses too and it seemed like this thing would just sort of roam about. Now one morning at 6am I was waiting for my mum to get ready to send me to school so I sat at the living room sofa, TV was in front and dining table was at my back and I saw it in the reflection of my TV. Long black hair, white clothed, sitting at the dining table area. I looked back to see and all the dining table chairs were empty. I kept looking at the reflection in the dining area back and forth but nothing was making any sense to which I slowly realized what it was and I took a pillow cover to my face and ears while lying down on the sofa. About half an hour or so goes by and my mother woke me up and when I looked at the TV reflection, the entity was gone. My life was terrible back then, having a violent and physically abusive dad, so things weren't smooth at all. And what made things worse with the hauntings was when my dad did black magic rituals, he would draw these diagrams like those in the occult using his blood and cigarette ashes. He would turn every religious display on the wall upside down in the house when he did the ritual. All of this was done when me and my mum weren't in the house. But after all of that, things got way worse. Shadow people started showing up at night. Some nights my mum would be woken up by me trying to help me switch on the toilet light as I'm small and couldn't reach the switch. I would always wake her up in the night to help me with this. And one night, she would be woken up by me to help switch on the toilet light. And as she was waiting, she called for me, but there was no response. 
and the plot twist was that I was actually asleep in my room and it wasn't me that woke her up to go to the toilet. One night too, my dad invited his other friend over to stay the night. I decided to sleep in the hall with his friend named Gary. Gary started hearing someone whisper calling his name from the front door. Weirdly, I couldn't hear anything at all and it just apparently kept going on and on until it freaked him out so much that he left the house. It was the last time that he came to our house too, but the next paranormal activity was when our toilet taps would turn on. But as soon as any one of us would walk towards the toilet, it would stop. Our toilet flush would go off on its own too, and I would hear like these mass whispers in the middle of the night, but couldn't make out what the whispers were saying. I would also hear like buzzing sounds when this happens, and no, I was not asleep or sleep paralysis at all. I was wide awake and moving freely. If you've ever seen the video of the YouTuber exploring an abandoned mine in the night to review a flashlight and hearing whispers, that's exactly what it sounded like. Another night, my dad got the worst out of us all. This shadow entity started climbing on top of him and choking him, two to be exact, one on top of him and another standing at the side of him, both with glowing red eyes. My dad was certainly a no-nonsense sort of guy and he wouldn't lie about something like this. I've seen other weird things like a white silhouette of a boy standing directly in front of me for a good two seconds before slowly disappearing into thin air. I've seen a shadow dart past the room and the hauntings, they didn't stop at all, even after my parents' divorce. Me and my mum, we went to stay at her brother's place while she rented out our home to foreigners for about two to three years solid. The tenants, they had not seen or heard any weird things in the house while we were gone, so we assumed that the haunting was over. Well, the entity with the black long hair and white clothes, it was gone, but the demonic entity that my father brought from his rituals, they were definitely still there tormenting the place when me and my mum moved back in. We would still see shadow entities dart past the halls, but really there was nothing more than that. Eventually, my mum sold the house a long time ago, and since then, thankfully, nothing else has happened. So I would love some insight as to what might be going on here. I have a client, her name is Kat. I was assigned her as a patient a month ago, and I love working with Kat. She's 78 and has dementia. And one day, I went down to the basement as that's where the laundry room is to do some laundry. As I was loading them, Kat came and silently stood behind me with a blank stare when I turned around. I was a little bit frightened, but just led her back to her chair upstairs where she normally sits. I have no idea how she got down there to be honest though, and the stairs usually creak so I'm not sure why I didn't hear it. Stairs are right above the washer and the dryer. Anyway, moving forward with my day, I go to switch the laundry and as I'm doing that, I hear the stairs start to creak so I go to lead Kat back to her chair and she just wasn't there. I came up and I saw her sitting there watching the TV. I don't think too much of it and go to continue what I was doing with no problems. And it was around this time that my stomach started hurting while switching laundry so I quickly went to the restroom. It's in the same room as the laundry. And when I came out, the lights were off. And I could also see someone in the hanging clothes area so I kind of panicked and turned the lights on but... When I did, no one was there. I went back upstairs and Kat was in the chair, so I just sort of sat down next to her, contemplating what had just happened. A few shifts go by and I don't encounter anything too alarming until the middle of this shift that I needed to use the restroom, so I went to the one upstairs. There's no restrooms on the main floor level, just the kitchen, dining room and living room because I was slightly nervous about going to the basement one. I shut the door behind me and I heard a deep whisper. I don't know what it said and 
It really scared me. I instantly turned around to go out though and slipped on the rug and bonked my head. I really wanted to brush it off though since I needed to be helping my patient and not be on some crazy ghost thing but I was really spooked by it. And so now I hurry to complete my tasks if they're anywhere beside the main level. A little bit of context to this third one. As I mentioned earlier, Kat has dementia and requests for me to leave at least six to ten times a day. However, on one of these days, she didn't do that and instead requested Vanessa to leave. I don't know a Vanessa. There was nobody else there and nobody else was home, so I just reassured her that it was just me and her. She did not want me to leave her sight that day though, so I tried my best to be with her the whole time while completing tasks, but she seemed really panicked. I tried not to let it get the best of me, and that could just be her having dementia, but I don't know, all of it together just really, really freaks me out. So, for context for this story, I live in a pretty rural area, I guess you could say. But we live on the outskirts of our town, which is already small compared to the populations of other towns in California. We're also about 15 minutes from the small town that we live by, and 40 minutes from the main city. We live down a dirt road with some neighbors. Our house has no other fences attached to ours, and on two sides of the house is only fields and dirt roads. One side has a single house and the field is all. The other two sides have a couple of neighbors down other roads and nobody really interacts out here except my dad talking to two of them sometimes. Now, I was probably 12 when this happened. I had low self-esteem and I wanted to start exercising more. I had been enrolled in a charter school due to bullying Yes, that played into my self-esteem, but let's not get into that story. So I didn't really have many ways of exercising besides a treadmill that we owned. I wanted to start getting fresh air too, so my mother suggested that since we live out here, that it would be peaceful to take walks down the back dirt road. I agreed, even though I was stubborn about it half the time, but we began walking and usually we would go into the mid to late afternoon and it would start cooling down outside, but was still light out. In case it got dark, we took our flashlight too. Being out here, it was notorious for stray dogs to sometimes make their way out here as well, and we would carry pepper spray and a mini bat, just in case one got vicious. And one day, me and my mum decided to go on a walk in the late afternoon. So me and my mum took off and started walking down the road, and we walked about maybe a quarter of the mile down there, you sort of start to come towards a little cross section. There's a road going left to the highway, a road going right to the neighbor's house, or the road goes straight down to a utility road. Me and my mum discussed walking down the utility road to get a good walk in since it went on for a while. When we were about to get to the crossroad, this dog came out of, well, pretty much literally nowhere. We were looking at it and it was in the center of the road just sort of staring at us. Me and my mum looked at it and my mum said that she got this feeling in her stomach that we needed to turn around and walk home. So she grabbed my arm and started leading me back home and then let go so that we could walk. We were in the midst of walking when she looks ahead and stops to stare at something. I ask what she's looking at and she points. There's a, what seems to be a white car pulled up to our fence and quickly backed up and shot down the road on the side of our house. Mind you, nobody ever goes down this road except one old man that we know. Anyone else who does this usually is scoping out my dad's tools to steal. Now, my mum said that she felt a bit uneasy because of it and pulled me to the edge of the dirt road, almost into the field. The car had driven to the highway and left. Or so we thought. We continued walking back to my house when this car comes back and drives down the road that we were walking alongside. I caught a glimpse and it was this smaller white car with black tinted windows that you couldn't see through. My mum instantly got a feeling of impending doom and pulled me into the field, 
Not too far, but far enough that we couldn't be seen. We kept walking through the field towards our house, getting closer now, when this car comes back down the road. My mum stops me in my tracks to see what the car is doing, and it drives back to our house and starts driving around it super quickly. For context, we have a random road and area that goes around our yard on our property. Now, my mum waits until the car drives back down the side road, and she tells me that we need to start running. So that's what we did. We started running through the field, getting to one of the little sections near my yard. The car comes back and drives down the road trying to cut us off. Me and my mum are panicking at this point and have no idea who this is and why they're acting like this. The car circles around again and my mum drags me further to the right, I think, of where we were and told me that we were going to run down into the ditch. We got down in the ditch and that's when the car comes back around and suddenly pulls to the edge of the ditch where we were. The front of the car was facing us and all I could think about was if it drove down, it would definitely hit me and my mum and probably kill us. My mum quickly put her arm in front of me and stood dead still while I was literally horrified and dropped our flashlight and I think my water bottle as well. The car though was getting ready to drive down where we were and then suddenly they backed up and drove around the yard again, going back down the side road to the highway. Me and my mum honestly felt like our souls almost left our bodies and she tells me to run, don't look back and get to the front gate. I run up the ditch feeling my heart pounding. I run around the yard and towards the front gate flinging it open and I started running towards the front door. I didn't hear my mum behind me but I was running to the door to open it right when I looked over and I saw the car coming back down the side road I ran into the house trying to catch my breath. I saw the car drive down the road and I didn't see my mum anywhere so I was panicking. I ran towards the sliding glass door and suddenly my mum comes running towards it and flings it open running in and locking it. She tells me to go and lock the front door. I was trying to catch my breath and trying to tell her that I was scared because I had no idea where she was. She went to chug some water from the fridge and told me that... When I was running, she was trying to shut the front gate when she noticed the car coming back down the road. She said that she knew that she wouldn't have time to follow me to the door, so she ran behind my sister's car to stay out of view of this car, and when it drove back down the road, she took the opportunity to run back to the door since it was closer to my sister's car. Once we caught our breath and we locked all the doors, we checked out the windows, but the car... Well, it was gone at this point. It is crazy to think, though, that if we hadn't have seen that dog standing there in the road that day and decided to turn back, that we may have actually been run down. Fortunately, we haven't seen that car again, and I think it may have just been some crazy personal druggie who just so happened to come down our road that day. Well, that's what I tell myself at least. Truly, I have no idea who that person was or people were, just that they seem to be looking for us, and I have no idea why that was. My husband had a history of his heart rate dropping into the low 40s. This morning... It started happening again and he collapsed once, got up and said that I needed to call 911. He said that something was different this time too. By the time the paramedics got him to the hospital, his heart rate was down to 20. He was surrounded by a team of nurses and doctors trying everything to bring his heart rate up. And this is when things got weird. They started shocking his heart to get it into a normal rhythm each shock, he said, was extremely painful. During these shocks, my husband looks up in the room full of doctors and nurses and sees an older woman in normal clothing, no badge on, and she approaches him. But this was during all of the chaos of multiple medical staff trying to save his life. The older woman reaches him and whispers in his ear. She tells him not to worry and that everything will be okay. 
As she was speaking to him, an incredible warmth filled his body and any fear that he had went away and he felt calm. The woman walks away. The doctors determine that he needs an emergency pacemaker installed. He has the surgery and then things get even weirder. In ICU recovering, he shares the story with me about the lady in the ER. While sharing his story with me, he's very emotional and even crying. I asked the nurse if there would have been anyone in the ER that would have approached him like the old lady in street clothes did, and she said no way. So this is definitely getting weirder at this point. For context, my husband is a 43-year-old, pretty much an atheist who doesn't believe in ghosts or angels or anything really. After a few days, he's released from hospital and he goes home. I post this amazing story on Facebook. A couple of days pass and our take on reality is shook to our core. I am sleeping on his third day home when I hear him screaming and crying. It's her, it's her, he says. I run to the room that he is in and he's bawling. I ask what's wrong and he shows me a picture on his phone. It's an obituary featuring a picture of an older lady. It's her, he cries. The obituary was text to him from a close friend of ours. She had saw my post about his ER experience and did a search of the people who had died in the hospital the same day that he was in the ER. And the lady that I was looking at had actually died around the same time that he was in the ER. What the heck, right? So this happened just a few years ago. We were on a family vacation in Cancun, husband, teen son and I. We were staying at a resort at that time. I was the first to wake up and went to the restroom. But there are huge windows covering up one wall, so we have the blackout curtains pulled over, so it's still kind of dark in the room. As I come back to bed, I can see a little bit of the morning light coming through the bottom of the room door. So I lay back on the bed facing my husband. And all of a sudden, he's shaking. He's facing away from me and towards the restroom. I put my hand on his arm and lightly move him and say, uh, Are you okay? He turns over to me and says that I just had a night terror and I saw him. He explained that as I was shaking him, the black figure that he saw got off of him and walked away. And he could see it was wearing gold and had a huge thing on its head like a crown or feathers of some kind. We both lay there staring around the room. I noticed the hallway to the restroom was extra dark all of a sudden. I pointed and my husband and I both saw a shadow and it moves up onto the wall and there was a door to a room conjoined to ours. The shadow moves toward the door, all the while we're just staring. All of a sudden the shadow disappears and then a second later you hear a blood curdling scream. I'm guessing that there was a little girl in the room next door because that's what we hear and we both look at each other with huge eyes. But we're both freaked out and get up and open the curtains to let the light in and we just talk about what we had just experienced. It was absolutely terrifying and we both thanked God that that was our last night there. So my mum's side of the family had a huge ranch down in Mexico. We used to go on weekends since we lived close to the border. This ranch consisted of seven homes divided by a street going down the middle and four homes on one side and three on the other. They were almost as if in a circle as well. Anyways, my aunts and cousins would always tell us stories of the things that happened and balls of light that they would see out there. One time we went there was a wedding party, so we were of course spending the night. And well, there were so many invited that there wasn't room for us to sleep in any of my aunt's homes, except of course for the house that no one lives in because my mum's uncle had supposedly done some black magic there and passed away in this home. This home was a two-room house, literally two whole rooms. 
The outside had two entrances to each of the rooms and they were connected by an entryway on the inside. So at this time I'm around 10 years old and it's me, my mum, my older sister who was 11 and younger sister who was 3. My mum inspects the room that we're to sleep in. There are two beds, one queen and one twin bed. My older sister ends up sleeping on the twin by herself. My mum also checks the only other room that is full of old furniture and items that you can't walk in that room since there's just way too many things and furniture piled up everywhere. The doorway that separated the rooms had no door as well but only a bed sheet hanging there. So I pass out and hear all about what happened afterwards. According to them, my mum and older sister, they couldn't go to sleep that night. We don't have AC and we have the windows open so the air comes through. And well, they suddenly hear footsteps outside as if someone was walking around the house multiple times. My mum had confirmed that the door to our room from the outside was locked. There was a door to the other room from the outside as well. When all of a sudden they hear the door to the other room open from the outside... And then, things being moved and thrown around in the other room. Of course, my mum gets up and turns on the light to see if anybody is in there. But when she does, she sees no one and is creeped out and tells us all to wake up. I'm sort of half awake at this point, not knowing what's happening, but my mum yells that we're leaving. We go to my mum's aunt's home across the street to stay with her. My mum then starts retelling them what happened. They sent some of her cousins to go and check on the house and to see if anyone had broken in. They go and come back and let us know that they didn't see any footprints around the house or anybody else inside. The next thing that my cousin says creeped us all out though. She was like, oh yeah, so I was getting some water. I looked out the window and I could see the house was on fire again. She said that it was normal to see it on fire since it's almost a nightly occurrence. Supposedly other people who move nearby to our ranch see the same thing as well. A huge fire but then once they get to the ranch to warn, the fire is just gone. It's supposedly all the black magic the uncle had done that the house is haunted like crazy we ended up getting some blankets set up for us on the floor and we just slept there for a little bit before the sun came up. I, though, was absolutely freaked out by this point and there was no way that I was about to go back to that house ever again. I have a lot of stories from my cousins in Mexico but this one, for whatever reason, has just always stuck with me. I would like to share some experiences myself and my family have had dating all the way back to the mid-1990s. For some quick context, I'm the oldest of four sons and we all grew up in this house. It's a small three-bedroom home in a quiet subdivision surrounded by wilderness. My parents bought it in 1982 and they still live there today. So I come from a very superstitious and some would call sensitive family. Most of them seem to be in tune with our extrasensory perception. In no ways do I consider myself to be a psychic or someone with extremely good precognition or clairvoyance or anything. But I do feel like I have been aware of unexplainable presences or feelings. Now, my mother explained to me that before she became pregnant with me, she never really noticed any strange or paranormal occurrences at home. When my mum got pregnant... She said that things changed. At this point, she started feeling a, a presence while at home. My father's work at the time had him gone for a week at a time, and my mum found herself feeling lonely and overthinking. At night, while trying to sleep, she felt like someone was in the room with her. She said that it wasn't an ominous or negative energy, but quite the opposite. As her pregnancy continued... Small objects started vanishing and showing back up. She bought some wind-up toys and toys that were activated by buttons. She placed them up in a shelf in a closet and they ended up on the closet floor, activated and playing. She says that she saw a female figure move from one room to another in the upstairs halls. At that point, 
She wanted to understand why the house had all these paranormal energies, but the house was newly built, not even 20 years old at that time. The previous owner was a single parent, but she never knew the age or gender of the children. My mum, she also started having complications with her pregnancy, and I was born nine weeks premature. I spent the first six months of my life in the hospital, dealing with issue after issue, but I managed to pull through. I know that this isn't related to the paranormal, but it's important context to later events and theories, I guess. Now, there was a time when I was a few months old when a pair of hats my mother and great-grandmother wore to a wedding somehow got moved from the attic storage into my mum's closet. It spooked my mum momentarily, but by then she had come to terms that she was sharing space with some sort of friendly spirit, ghost, or presence, or whatever. These things... They really didn't bother her too much, but besides that, not much else really ever happened. One of the strangest but more powerful things that happened in my childhood home took place when I was still very young. You see, even though I was eight months old, I still couldn't roll myself over very well or sit up. Embarrassing, right? Sure, but I mean, what could I do? I was just a baby. My mum was home alone again with me. She put me down for a nap and went to lay down in her bedroom across the hall. She was quite tired that day, so sleep took over quickly. She says that she had a very vivid dream that day. She was in some sort of a, a white room. It was bright. She was sort of standing in place. She felt someone enter the space with her, though. It was a, a welcoming presence, one she felt before. But a more ominous feeling showed up too, almost like impending doom, or that feeling when you just know that something just isn't right. And then she heard the voice of a girl. It told her, the baby, it's the baby. And the voice repeated itself as she jolted awake. She sensed that something was wrong. She rushed across the hall, which luckily it was only a mere seven feet or so into my bedroom. And I somehow had myself face down on the crib's mattress. I must have decided that it was time to move myself around, but I was clearly unable to push my face out of the mattress. Asking my mum this story now, and she'll tell you with great detail how real the dream felt and how scary it all was. As I got older, I was told around three or four that I started chatting to an imaginary friend. I would spend a lot of time sitting up in my room, stationed on my floor with all sorts of toys. I would be having full-on conversations, apparently, with no one. When my parents asked me who I was talking to, I always told them her name was Tara. I told them that she was a little girl a bit older than me. I said that she was nice. I didn't let this up for years, I've been told. I can remember understanding at a young age, maybe eight or nine, that our house had spirits in it. But I was raised and told that they were harmless, that they were just here with us, and I must admit that I felt it too. I didn't mind it, honestly. It really didn't scare me. What scared me, though, instead was sudden loud noises and movies about vampires, I guess, but fast forward to my teenage years now, I was sleeping on a Friday night. Across from my bed was a large dresser and pushed beside was a longer but shorter dresser. It was tall and sturdy enough that a young person could hop up on it if they wanted to and sit on it. I remember coming out of a strange dream and I started to wake up. I opened my eyes and they were met with somebody else's gaze. It was a young girl, dark hair, clothes that looked like they were from decades prior. She was sat up on my dresser looking at me. I nearly jumped out of my skin because, I mean, honestly, who expects that? Now, was she scary looking? No, but I believed at the time that it was Tara. I've seen her a few other times or possibly another female. I come home to visit my parents and at times I get the same intense feeling. It's pretty hard to explain that feeling, but it's just like I know that one of these ghosts or spirits or whatever are around and they're welcoming me back. 
I'll walk into the house, especially if I'm the first to arrive home, and the whole feel of my surroundings will just change. Again, it's hard to explain, but I've come to learn that it's the type of feeling that I get when Tara must be around. When I'm spending time alone at the house though, especially downstairs in the basement, I'll see a dark female figure move across the back of the room, the shape of the body reflecting off the glass paneling of my parents' bar. It'll move into the laundry room and disappear. I've seen it in reflections of windows upstairs, standing in various spots around the home, as if they're just sort of sharing space with me, as if they're just trying to say hi. I'm older now, I've just turned 30, but in all of the apartments that I've lived in, I've had paranormal experiences. Nothing too horrifying, thank goodness, but I always seem to have something happen, and I guess I'm okay with it now. Maybe I'll share some of those moments another time, but I would be lying if I tried to make my story sound like some horrid poltergeist haunting with objects thrown and evil lurking around or whatever. And while I truly believe that not all aspects of the paranormal are spooky or scary, sometimes they are pretty strange. The experiences I guess can be enlightening, that maybe we do share our lives with others who have passed on, who just want to make themselves known from time to time. Maybe to watch over us, who knows. It's all very complex, but I do believe that I've had ghosts follow me around pretty much all my life. My name is Edgar and I'm 16 years old. I'm from the Netherlands and when I was around 7 to 8, I can't remember the exact age, but it was around 2014 to 2015. It was a warm summer day. I was alone out in the garden playing in the pool. I loved playing outside in that garden, even up until this day. I was just swimming and playing with toy soldiers for like an hour. Then I stood out of the pool and looked up straight, and on top of my shed I saw a very tall figure crouching down. I could tell it was tall because it had its knees just above its head when crouching. Its right arm was gripping the gutter drain on the side of the shed, and the other one was holding itself up on the roof. It had jet black skin and a dirty grin on its face. The smile was all the way up to its ears as well and it had bright white eyes. As soon as it noticed that I saw it, its pupils went pinpoint. But its smile stayed the same and after around 10 seconds, it felt like hours, it just jumped into the bush beside the shed and to be honest, I actually did wet myself. Then I stared at the bush for like two minutes just frozen in shock before running inside and telling my parents. My mom, she didn't believe me until years later when I brought up the story again. And she said that she knew that I saw something, just wasn't sure what it was. I had many different drawings on the thing and I've written many stories in school about the thing that I saw. I didn't go near that bush or that shed for years and... Sometimes when I'm out and about, I feel that feeling of being watched out there. And I don't mean that in the sort of dark creepy stairs running up sort of feeling, but I mean the feeling of actually being watched. From the start of last year, I became an Orthodox Christian and that feeling just suddenly stopped. I know many people will think that I'm lying about this, but I swear that this actually happened and it definitely traumatized me for a long time. I remember almost every detail and it's honestly something that I wish I could forget. During the pandemic, my mum was still going to work and at that time I stayed home a bit. But one day my mum went to work as always and I was playing computer games. I got a glass of water, I was in the living room and I finished my water and then I went to the kitchen to refill but that's when things started. But when I stood up I heard a sort of snoring sound from the bedroom. I was a little bit scared by that but I thought the sounds were coming from my Xbox or my PC at first. 
I went to check them out and sort of went to mute them or whatever, but they were definitely silent. I went to the bedroom slowly, and it was obvious that the sounds were coming from the bedroom. I sort of peeked through the gap in the door, and when I looked, I saw a figure under the blanket in the bed, covered up by the blankets. It was as if my mum was there, and she had covered herself with a blanket and hidden there. For a second, I thought that I was going crazy, or maybe I was schizophrenic or something and just hallucinating. I ran to the kitchen. I grabbed a knife because I genuinely thought that we had an intruder. I went to the bedroom. I came next to the bed and when I pulled the blanket back, there was nothing there. But after I pulled the blanket, the sounds suddenly stopped as well. I ran out of there and I ran out of the house actually. And I waited for my mum for over six hours and I never told her this story. This was the year that I experienced more terrifying events as well. My mum went to meet a friend and I was alone at home again. I had bought some chips and cola and I was playing video games like normal. Eventually I was watching some Netflix and everything was fine. But eventually I must have fallen asleep on the couch at like 9pm. At 10pm I heard some noises and woke up. I was still lying on the couch but I wasn't sleeping. I looked at the time and it was 10 o'clock and then I heard sounds from the door to the outside. I heard the sound of our door opening and I thought that my mum had come home so I pretended to sleep. I heard her footsteps and then she came next to me and said, Oh you silly, why didn't you cover yourself up with a blanket? She then covered me with a blanket and she walked away from me and went to her room. I heard the footsteps again. Then I stood up and went to her room, but when I did, there was nobody home. When I say that I have never been so scared in my life, it is hard to explain just how terrified I actually was at that point. I went to my room, I locked the door, and I sort of barricaded myself in there. Eventually I fell asleep, and in the morning I asked my mum when she came home, and she said that she only got home at 11.30. These events definitely shook me at the time and they're something that I'll never forget. A long time ago, when my daughters were quite young and my teenager was about 14, we lived in what was very likely one of the first houses on the street which was probably about 60 to 70 years old. It was so old, in fact, that the quarter of an acre block that we lived on had the house facing with the front door facing the backyard. The back door was facing the driveway where we would park, so it was kind of back to front, I guess you could say. Unfortunately, the owners, they had sold the house and we needed to leave. We had secured another property and were almost finished packing everything into our moving van, it had all the usual old farmhouse charm. It was beautiful and we really loved it. One thing though about that place was that there was this storage type cupboard up above the linen cupboard. I think it's quite common to have a bit of storage area high up in the older houses like this. It was a small old wooden door with a very strong lock on it and it was just really odd. We always felt a bit strange about it, but of course, being curious, we tried to open it many, many times, but it was just completely jammed shut. My littlest daughter was, and is, extremely sensitive to lots of dark stuff, as well as just general mystical stuff as well, and she would have these interesting dreams where she would be what would probably be called having an out-of-body experience. She would travel to all different places and attend all different kinds of events such as car accidents, hospital operations, bedsides of sick people, lots of strange things. She used to be called Spooky Boo because of all this. Anyway, the last night before we were leaving, she woke up with a nightmare. She was only three at the time, but she had had a really terrible nightmare about the cupboard opening. When it opened, a long, dark-clawed hand appeared to be coming out of it, 
and that frightened her enough to be awake and screaming. I came to her straight away and cuddled her and comforted her. She came into my bed that night and in the morning we packed up the rest of our boxes and had one more look around before leaving. And that was when my oldest daughter and I looked up and noticed that that cupboard, the one that refused to open no matter how hard we tried, was now completely open. We immediately turned around and we left and we never went back. We still think about that farmhouse and all the fun that we had there. It honestly was an amazing house. It had become a refuge for us and we felt very free and happy there. But that never took away the chill that we felt when we thought of that strange cupboard. How on earth it opened like that, I have no idea. And how it opened when my daughter had that dream that night, again, I have no idea, but something tells me that it wasn't a coincidence. When I was five, I saw a boy older than me around the house. He always made me feel afraid, so I would always run to my mother in the end. I moved to many houses as a kid, and he always followed. When he was around, dishes fell off the table, toys fell, and loud noises would always happen. My childhood was high stress, and he always seemed to be around during high stress as well. As I got older, he just stopped showing up and I guess I just surpassed that age where things like this happen. He seemed about 9 years old and at 13 I stopped seeing him and thought maybe he was an imaginary friend or a childlike hallucination. That was until today when I saw him, the same 9 year old boy, walk from my bedroom to the kitchen out of my sight. I won't be saying anything to my family because, honestly, it sort of makes me feel psychotic. But not even 10 seconds later, my brother walks into my room to tell me that he heard a bunch of stuff fall in our basement and someone talking. I didn't hear this and I didn't tell him about the boy because I'm skeptical and so is he. I told him that I would check out the basement and then he left for the bus stop. I'm 21 and I've not seen this boy since I was a kid. And quite honestly, I'm looking for a mental explanation. I know that it's probably nothing, but it just really shook me. I mean, why do I see this boy? Also, there's no way in heck that I'm checking on that basement. I only said that to give peace of mind to my brother. But if anybody can relate to this or tell me that... I need a mental evaluation or something, then please do let me know. Because this, this has me troubled. So, a colleague and I attended a seminar in Belgium. We were in a hotel housed in a building from the 19th century. And while the interiors have been modernized... They retain the old facade of the building, lending a lot of character to it. At the end of the busy first day, my colleague and I went back to the room to rest before joining the other participants for a night out. I went to the bathroom to freshen up while my colleague started dozing off in his bed. I'd been in the bathroom for maybe 10 minutes when I just heard a blood-curdling scream coming from the bedroom. I ran outside to see what was happening I found my colleague having a nightmare. I shook him vigorously to wake him up. When he woke up, I asked him what he dreamt of. He said that he had a very vivid dream where he saw several children huddled together on one side of our room. They looked like they were dressed from another era and they looked frightened. A European nun then walked in and pressed her hands tightly around his neck and that's when he started screaming. We dismissed the nightmare as a result of jet lag or exhaustion or something. But the following morning when we were having breakfast at the hotel restaurant, we asked the waiter what the building was previously. And apparently, the building was initially a convent and then was transformed into an orphanage run by nuns up to the 1980s before it was abandoned and then later converted into a hotel. 
we both got goosebumps after hearing the story and after recalling his nightmare. And in the end, we're not so sure that it was actually a real nightmare and instead that he had a ghostly preview of the hotel's past. So my mum and dad were out of town and I was staying with my uncle and was cooking something for myself at some point when somebody rang the doorbell. I opened the door and it was a worker. There was some construction work going on in the house next door. No one lives there. The owners were just getting some work done in the house. And the worker came to my house to get a matchbox for I don't know what reason exactly and in the end I just gave it to him. While fetching the matchbox, I left the door opened and while I was bringing it, I saw that the man was very weirdly checking out the house. I ignored it, but it definitely felt a bit weird. I gave him the matchbox, but he didn't just instantly go away. He sort of stood there for almost three seconds, holding the matchbox in his hand and sort of staring at me. It creeped me out a little bit, but... As usual, I just sort of ignored it, and I closed the door. And I don't know why I did this, but I just peeped through the peephole to see him, and he was still standing there, ogling at the door. And it was around this point that it really started to scare me. I went inside and continued my work, and 15 minutes later, the doorbell rang again. This time, my uncle checked the door, and the man was like, Hello, your daughter helped me so much that I just want to return that gratitude and paint one of your rooms. That sounded a little bit odd to my uncle because, I mean, painting a room for a matchbox? My uncle declined the offer, but the man was reluctant. He was like, it will only take an hour. I just want to color her room and make it beautiful. Please, sir, one room won't take much time. Now, my uncle's gut feeling was giving up. He was like... There's something off about this guy, so he declined it one last time. And this time, when he saw him through the peephole, he too caught him staring at the door. And he stood there for quite some time. This whole situation was quite creepy. And I don't know what his intentions were, but it definitely had my uncle and I on high alert. So, to start this off, I want to say that I've never seen anything like this in my life. At the time, I was 15 years old pet-sitting a friend of mine's dogs while they were out of town and in Benson, Arizona is where this took place. This property, it had a lot of acres and it took about 15 minutes to get to their little house right in the middle of probably about 75 acres. At the time, it was about, I want to say 10 p.m. My friend had eight dogs and they usually stayed outside for the most part because they were big watchdogs who seemed to have been able to defend themselves in the past. Before everything happened, I was inside their tiny home making food and then I heard the biggest dog start squealing kind of quietly, very scared and seemed to be in pain but loud enough for me to hear. I knew the sounds were unusual that this dog was making, so I shut up and ran outside to see what was going on. I thought maybe the dog might have hurt himself or something similar. Maybe they'd gotten into a fight or something. But this just was not the case. And when I got out there, I ended up seeing a five to six foot tall, pale, very skinny creature hunched over this dog, sucking on its head. I was stunned almost too stunned to speak, but I managed to shake that feeling off. I start yelling at this thing because the dog started yelping loud, and I'm telling this creature to get out of here and trying to scare it off. I run over to her dog as fast as I could because I've heard of these things before, maybe a, a chupacabra, and I know that they would likely eat the dog if I didn't do anything. But I stop about 10 feet in front of it to see this creature jump up and run as fast as it can away on two legs. After that, I couldn't help but keep looking over my shoulder the rest of the time that I was there. 
I also didn't let these dogs out that night and I didn't care to go out there either. So when my friends come back, I told them everything that happened and what I saw. It felt like everyone was just as frightened as I was and that made me even more unsettled. I ended up leaving that desert and I did not look back. I still don't know what to make of it to this day except that I want to say that it was something demonic. This was maybe six to seven years ago. I have photos on my camera as well still, but I haven't changed it in ages. I gave up on photography, you know how it is. So I hope that you guys can just trust me. So we've been going on these trips as a family for a really long time now. Probably 17 years if I had to guess. I won't say where it is that we go, but it's in the Australian bush just to give you all an idea of the setting. Anyway, we've had a few creepy experiences there, but nothing inexplicable, I guess. But this event, it still weirds me out, and I cannot really think of anything that explains it. So, the year of this, my sister, cousin, dad, and myself all drove up together and were the first to arrive at the house. We had to wait for my grandma to arrive with the key, so my dad sat on the deck with a beer and my sister, cousin, and I went on a little journey. The three of us made our way to a little creek not far from the house that we nicknamed Bride to Terabithia because of the tree that had fallen and acted as a bridge for use to get across the creek. This creek, it never had water in it though and was not deep or wide. We could easily walk through it is what I'm getting at, but the tree was fun. Anyways, my cousin makes an off-the-cuff sort of comment as we walk across the tree asking, sort of sarcastically, is there something dead around here? Because of how many flies there were. Lo and behold, we get to the other side and there was something dead. We were greeted with a dead kangaroo. Nothing too jarring. I mean, I'd seen plenty on the side of the road. But this one, this one was cut clean in half. And when I say clean, I mean clean. Like it was perfectly halved, surgically. Also, there wasn't even an ounce of blood on the fur, no blood on the ground, and the top half was just nowhere to be found. I happened to have my camera on me, and I took some photos of it, then my cousin poked it with a stick, and literally hundreds of flies came out of it. My cousin and sister kept poking at it, trying to move it into the creek, but a fully grown kangaroo, even half of one, isn't exactly light. Their sticks, they eventually broke, so I grabbed it by the tail and pulled it into the creek so that we could bury it, but really we just covered it with sticks and flowers. We looked up top everywhere for the second half or a trace of what might have happened to it, but we just couldn't find anything. We ended up going back down into the creek and walking through it looking for something and what we found only made the whole situation even more confusing. We found, if I remember correctly, four dead rabbits, but only their bottom halves, all lined up neatly along the floor of the creek until it reached thick brush that we couldn't walk through any longer. But it was the same thing with these rabbits though. No top halves to be found, no blood anywhere, cut clean in half, like surgically. It got too weird at this point, so at that, we just left. We never went back there the entire trip that we were there that time. Although, we've been back to this place every year since then, and we have never seen anything like this again. My first encounter was when I was super young. We were currently living in an apartment in Orlando, Florida. I was maybe three or four and I just remember looking into one of those large bulky TVs and seeing rows of what looked like dead people in this TV which was turned off mind you. In that same house, as odd as it sounds, I was laying down in my parents bed 
and remember seeing an evil looking shadow of what looked like Crash Bandicoot. My next encounter, I think I was five or six in Miami, Florida at my stepdad's house. My family and his always said that that house was haunted and I guess they must have been right. They'd mentioned hearing dishes being moved and things like that, but no one ever saw that face that I did. No one but me. The first time that I saw it, it was only a shadow figure. The way the room was set up next to the door frame was a mirror, and across from that mirror was my bunk bed. All of a sudden, the bed started shaking as if a grown man was trying to destroy it, I happened to look in that mirror and on that top bunk was this shadow figure that looked as demonic as anything can really. The most prominent features were the horns though. They curled almost all the way back to its back. In the end I covered myself with pillows in the hopes to mask or forget about what was going on right above me. Eventually it stopped and I didn't sleep that night. To this day, I sleep with at least 10 pillows on my bed because of this as well. In that same house, my mum said that she would see a shadow figure walk to our doorways and make some sort of a symbol on our doors or doorways. Why she didn't say anything to anybody is absolutely beyond me, but that woman was kind of crazy. In that same house, I was climbing a pantry. The top of this pantry, there was a sort of space between the topmost shelf and the door frame probably around two or so. When I reached the top, this face just popped out at me. A purely white face, almost like a ceramic mask, with eyes that I can only describe as void of light. It came within inches of my face and I instantly dropped. This was the first time that I saw its face, the first time it introduced itself to me. And since that moment... I've never been able to comfortably open a closet without the fear of seeing it. Fast forward, I'm more probably about seven to nine years old, playing with some Legos in a bath. The bathroom had an exhaust fan in the center of the ceiling, and as I was chilling in the tub, I recall looking up at it, this exhaust fan, and thinking, huh, that looks kind of like a face but I was young, so I just told myself that it was the fan moving quickly. It just sort of looked still when I looked at it. Then my older brother Justin walked in, and that was when the eyes on this face moved with a speed that I still could not put into words, snapping onto him and following him throughout the bathroom. I told Justin he couldn't leave that bathroom without me, and the face was purely white with those black empty eyes again. That's when I recognized it again. Again, I didn't see it for years, but I was terrified to be alone. The next time I was in sophomore in high school, probably like 15 or 16, I lived in the basement of our current house. It was only me, my younger sister, and my mother in the house at this point. I also had a friend who would come over every now and then just to hang out or whatever. The way the basement was laid out, my bed was close to this sort of open room that my mum used as her closet, and on the other side of the room was the bottom entrance of the basement. So, when you come in through the basement, you turn to the right and you see the open closet, my bed, and the stairs that lead to the top floor. My friend came over one day and, as I let him in, he just starts freaking out. This kid was a very hard kind of person as well, who wouldn't show this type of reaction to most things. So naturally, I'm trying to figure out what he's freaking out at, and he tells me that he saw a white face with black eyes peeking out from that closet. Honestly, I didn't like the guy too much, so I hadn't told him about any of my experiences. But when he told me that, I moved upstairs and that fear was suddenly reignited. I never saw the face again, but I could have swore that I felt it. Then, at 24 years old, I was laying in bed with my now ex-wife, back to back, and she started screaming at me to stop poking her in the face. I never felt so cold because I was practically asleep at this point and wasn't anywhere near close to touching her face. She quickly realized this too, and she suddenly backed up to me even more. 
Up until my senior year in high school, I thought that I was just a, a schizophrenic, to be honest. It wasn't until I spoke to Justin, my older brother, that I realized that this was as real as real gets. As I told him what happened on that bunk bed, he suddenly started crying and tearing up pretty hard. I had only seen him cry maybe once or twice in his whole life because he made himself into this sort of macho man. So I asked him why he was crying and he told me that the same exact thing happened to him years prior in that house in Orlando on the same exact bunk bed. That told me that it wasn't my stepdad's house and nor was I crazy. There are more things that happened to my siblings and family. For example, in a house we resided in at Warner Robins, GA, my little sister dreamed of my little brother being stuck in the bathroom of the house, unable to get out, while these green glowing eyes were staring at him from the mirror. When she woke up, Keanu, my little brother, was in the bathroom claiming to have seen green glowing eyes. In this same house, Annalise would randomly sort of wander the house, sleepwalking, almost in a trance. My older sister Melissa and her wife Leanne caught Annalise walking around one night, and they said that they saw an orb fly past as they saw Annalise in her trance-like state. Honestly though, I think that this all started because my mum and her older sister, my Tia, played with a Ouija board when they were really young. They claimed the bed floated and my grandparents soon after threw it out or whatever. They never said bye apparently and allegedly that's a big no-no. But all of this, it still haunts me very much. And what I really hope is that I never see that white face ever again.